Hi and welcome to the JavaScript Crash Course. I'm really excited to see every one of you here and I'm really, really excited to present this Crash Course to you. In this Crash Course, we are going to study all the beginner and intermediate level concepts of JavaScript. And we're gonna wrap this Crash Course up by creating three modern looking real world uh, components that you can use right away in your projects. Now, before jumping into this crash course, I need to get this out of the way that to be able to understand JavaScript, you need to have beginner to intermediate level knowledge of HTML and CSS. Because JavaScript is based on HTML and CSS, you need to be familiar with that. Uh, and I do have, if, if you're not familiar with HTML and CSS, I do have a playlist right here on YouTube where you can go ahead, you can watch HTML, uh, and learn HTML, CSS from the ground up. Uh, there is like more than 140 videos. There are three projects. It's just a cool playlist. I recently added that. It's updated. All the cool new features of CSS are included there as well. If you are looking for a more comprehensive approach, uh, I have two uh, courses on HTML and CSS on Udemy. The link you will find in the video description where I show you how you can create real world projects that are performant and that are very, very cool looking and you will learn a lot of real world skills by completing those two courses. And I do have a JavaScript bootcamp on Udemy as well. It's just 10 bucks. It's uh, it's very, very cheap. You can just buy it, and it's more than 60 hours of content. Uh, and uh, you need to keep this in mind as well, that this video in no means is, is a JavaScript course. This is just a crash course, just something that is going to get you familiar with JavaScript. If you want to get more projects, more hands-on approach to learning JavaScript, you can always check my Udemy course. The link will be in the video description is in the video description. So now that that is done, um, who is this crash course for? Uh, yeah, if you are uh, a beginner level JavaScript developer, you have you you don't have any kind of experience, you, you don't even know what JavaScript is, but you do have HTML and CSS knowledge, then this is gonna be a good starting point. Uh, and even if you are an intermediate or an advanced dev level developer, you can always brush up on your knowledge by taking this crash course uh, and okay let's jump into what we are going to study now by the end of this crash course you will have all these three projects but before uh, jumping into actually talking about the projects I'm going to be using VS Code since you already have knowledge of HTML and CSS I'm sure you have an editor of your choice most likely it's going to be VS Code but in case it isn't just Go ahead and switch to VS Code. You can find it in code.visualstudio.com. It's gonna detect your OS. Just go ahead and install it. It's very, very simple, lightweight. There is a ton of extensions. And this is the editor that I'm gonna be using for this crash course. So if you want your setup to be exactly like mine, just go ahead and download that. Uh, the first component that I'm gonna show you how to create is gonna be this off canvas responsive menu. Uh, where uh, you can use this uh, immediately in your projects. If I just zoom in, uh, if I just click on this responsive tab, below some uh, below a specific threshold, because there, the links cannot be fit horizontally, what we are gonna do is we are gonna provide them in an off canvas menu, which is completely responsive. Doesn't matter how, uh, how small the screen size is. And as far as the HTML and CSS is concerned, for the projects, uh, I am going to I'm going to type them and I'm going to explain them, but I'm not going to jump into too much detail since you already have HTML and CSS knowledge. I'm just going to tell you enough to connect the dots. Cool. This is the first project. The second project is an accordion. Uh, this accordion you might have seen this uh, in some websites where they answer. Uh, frequently asked questions like at the bottom of the website there is the question title and when you click on it the answer uh, it expands to show the answer you can click on this you can click on this so this is something that we do with JavaScript and this is just a simple calculator where I created with JavaScript and I just wanted to practice uh, some uh, DOM manipulation with JavaScript uh, 
Now, now that we know, uh, you know, okay, um, what you should know before taking this crash course, where you can find more content. Let's jump into this crash course. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about what JavaScript is. Uh, JavaScript is a programming language. It is used to create web applications like Facebook. It is used to create mobile applications like the mobile version of Facebook, mobile app for Facebook. It is used to create server-side applications. It's used to create desktop applications. In fact, VS Code has been created using JavaScript through a, an, a framework that is called Electron. So it's, it's got a lot of applications. It is the most used and um, it is the most liked programming language in the world. It's the most famous next to Python. And it is something that, that if you learn, you will be able to do so many things with it, with, it, with this um, JavaScript. Uh, now, the way that I'm going to actually start coding is I'm just going to uh, open up my PowerShell. Let's open it up on the other window. There we go. Here is my PowerShell. I'm going to be closing all these three windows. I'm not going to need anything. We are starting from scratch. So when I load up my PowerShell, what I'm going to do is, first I'm going to nav navigate to desktop, so CD desktop. You can just create a folder and right click on it, you open it with VS Code, but I'm going to go this way. And on the desktop, I'm going to create a folder that is going to be JS resource files, cool, YT YouTube. I'm going to create this. I have created this file and I'm going to uh, CD into this file, CDJS. Uh, I'm going to hit tab. It's going to autocomplete it. When I do ls, there is nothing in this cr uh, directory currently. I'm going to open up VS Code in this directory by doing code dot. This just opened up this VS Code window on the other screen that I have. And there we go. I'm going to move this here. Now that we have opened up VS Code in this folder that we created, the first thing that I'm going to create is going to be an index.js. But a couple of things first. Uh, I, I already have some settings in case you want to you wanna go exactly like me. For word wrap, I've set it to word uh, wrap. I've set it to on. It means that when lines get to the end of the, the window, they're going to wrap to the next line. They're not going to create a horizontal scroll bar. Uh, oops, <laughs> I was about to show you one more. Um, uh, I also have font size, in case you're wondering. Font size for me, it's 20. Uh, next up, uh, tab size, I think, Ye two. Yeah, it was four. I reduced it to two. And we'll, let's see what else. Format on save. Uh, it is uh, tick marked. Uh, that is because... Uh, when you are starting out with uh, JavaScript, there is a ton of uh, best practices and a ton of rules that you keep in mind that you need to keep in mind when it comes to coding. So your code doesn't look amateurish. Your code has to look professional, and it is very difficult when when you don't have any kind of experience with JavaScript. J learning all these things, it's going to be very difficult. There are some some extensions that ease this for you. That is this process. One of them is Prettier. It is, uh, I think, the most famous. Uh, it supports all these languages right here. And you just have to install it. And after you installed it, come to Settings. Uh, come to Settings and just say Format on, I'm going to say Format on Save, uh, Ave, Save, and just click this. This just tick mark it. Reload the browser, uh, sorry, browser. Reload VS Code and you'll be good to go. Uh, I'm also using Live Server uh, for this one. And for the theme, if you are wondering about it, it's the bearded theme that I've installed. It is the bearded Arc Blueberry, if you want to know what the theme is that I'm using. So now that everything, all this setup is out of the way, I'm going to click right here. I'm going to create our very first file that is going to be the index.html file. Within the index.html, let's create, create a boilerplate. I'm going to say JavaScript crash course. I hope the zoom level is okay. I could zoom one level in, but I think this is too zoomed in. 
I think this is okay. I'm sure you can read it. It's pretty good. After I've created that, I'm going to create an index uh, an app.js file. So this is where we actually get started with our crash course. Now, uh, we know that if we want to create an HTML file, the extension name has to be .html. When we create a CSS file, it has to be .css. Uh, but when we are trying to create a, a JavaScript file, the extension name is JS. Now, the name of the file, this app part, it doesn't matter what that is. It could be anything. But the extension, it has to be .js. Cool. Now we have created our very first JavaScript file and how you can connect it. Uh, when we connect CSS, it's, it comes in the head part of the HTML, but JavaScript is actually connected using something called a script element. In the script element, if you type anything in between, this is not considered a good practice, but it is good for beginner level programmers, beginners who get started with programming. Uh, in this, uh, here is the realm of JavaScript. Any kind of JavaScript logic can be executed here. But because we are trying to learn it efficiently and also pay attention to all the best practices, we need to separate JavaScript file from the uh, HTML file. This is called separation of concerns. HTML must have a different file. JavaScript must have a different file. CSS must have a different file. Well, uh, in the source, since both of them are in the same directory, I could do uh, forward slash and just grab app.js, uh, dot forward slash app.js. I could do that, but I'm just going to type in app.js. That is going to do it for me. And when you hold control and click, it's going to uh, bring you to this app.js file. Cool. So the first lesson was actually what JavaScript is, which I briefly introduced. And this, the aim of this entire crash course, uh, as many hours as it took, uh, as it's going to take, I don't know. Uh, the aim of this entire crash course is to teach you what JavaScript is and to get you started with JS. And let's just start with creating our very first program. Now, the way that I'm going to code all the lectures will be, uh, all of them will be within one file within this app.js file, and I'm going to be naming the lectures. Uh, and the first thing about JavaScript that I'm going to teach you is JavaScript comments. Comments are when you don't want something to run uh, or be compiled or be rendered, you write comments. For example, in HTML, if you, write a, if you write a comment, that comment will not be shown on the screen. The same goes for JavaScript. Uh, if you want to write notes for yourself or you want to write, uh, document your code, so when you come back in three months, six months, you know what exactly it is that you've done. Uh, then you're going to write a comment. Comments are just comments on your code that you provide extra info on the code. There are two kinds of comments. There is the single line comment, and then there is the CSS comment, which is multi-line comment. This is exactly like the CSS comments. Uh, I'm going to be using single line comments to write the name of the lesson that we're on or the name of the concept that we're on. The first concept that we're going to talk about will be uh, creating or writing your very first program. And I'm going to save this. Now, before moving forward, let's uh, go live with this. Right click, uh, open with live server. You can also click this little thing down below when it says go live. You can click on it as well. Now, there, there are two things that I could do here. I could just um, move between windows like this, which I think is not pretty. It's not pretty. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put these two side by side. Let's grab our code. There we go. This is our code. Cool. And this, the left side, VS Code, everything that we write is going to be on the left side. And on the right side, we have the browser window where we're going to check our code. Now, the first program that I'm going to teach you is how you can print something with JavaScript to the console. Where is the console? Right click, go to inspect, and let's get out of this uh, view. And if I come here, uh, if I just bring this here, you know that on the left side you have uh, HTML, on the right side you have CSS, but here is another tab that says console. If you click on it, this is where all the console for JavaScript is going to appear. All right, enough of talking. Let's jump into code. 
Uh, let's create the first program. Uh, now I'm going to access console in the JavaScript and I'm going to say log, which, which basically prints something. And I'm going to say hello world. Congratulations, you just created your very first program with JavaScript. Now this program doesn't do much, right? It just prints something to the console. But it is nonetheless a program. Cool. Now that this part is done, I'm going to comment this one out. I could just add a couple of forward slashes at the start of it, or I could just uh, go to that line and do control forward slash. That is going to um, convert it to comment, comment it out as well. Uh, I On Mac, I believe it is command forward slash. I'm not really sure you can. I think it's command. Command is the equivalent of control on for Windows. I've never owned a Mac, so I'm not sure you can just go ahead and check that out. Uh, let's jump into our next idea. Uh, next up, we are going to talk about how we can create a variable. This is going to be concept number three or lesson number three. Now, the reason that we need variables is that whenever we work with JavaScript, we tend to store stuff or store data. And that data could have different types, right? It could be a number, it could be a string or a word. It could be a list of stuff. It could be like anything else. So you need to know how we can store data and why do we need to store data is because we need to be able to use it wherever we want. Oftentimes when you select something from HTML, you store it in a variable and then you keep using that variable. Uh, you don't keep uh, selecting the same elements uh, over and over again, that is not good. You store it and then you use that element by its identifier, which is the actual technical term, or by its variable name. Variables are like containers, like a box. You put several things in it, for example, you put several books in a box. That box is a variable. The name or the label that you put on that box is the variable identifier or the name of the variable. And whatever you put in that box is going to be the content of the box. Let's go by that example. I know it's cliche, but it works really well. Let's say I want to create uh, a variable that is going to hold fruits for me. What type of fruit it's going to be? It's going to be an apple, like a, a bag or a container or a box just with one apple inside of it. Let is a special JavaScript keyword. There are a lot of special JavaScript key, uh, keywords that are available to us by JavaScript. The same ones we had in HTML, like body is a special keyword, like this title. You can create another element that has the name of title. And the same goes for JavaScript. When there is something special, you can't use it because that is already reserved for JavaScript. You can't use let unless it is in a string. You can't use it as an identifier. This is the name of the box. And uh, this uh, equality sign is the assignment operator. What does that mean? It means I'm assigning Apple the value of Apple to the variable fruit. So any time that I want to access this value Apple, I'm just going to access it using its identifier which is this fruit. And every JavaScript expression could be terminated with a semicolon. Although it is not necessary, but even if you don't provide it, if you say control save, it's going to add, uh, the prettier is going to add it by default. So uh, if, you, if you don't want to take a look, if you don't want to see it, you can just tweak the prettier settings, which I'm not going to. Now, now that we have created our first variable, how can we take a look at it? We can take a look at it in the console.log. Now I'm no longer going to pass an apple because I've, I've added an identifier to that apple, which is fruit. And when I save it, it's going to show me apple. So instead of writing this apple several times, I can just copy paste this line. And now I'm going to get four. I'm going to get four apples. Cool. The way that I copied these lines was hold shift, press alt, and then the down arrow or the up arrow. It doesn't matter. There we go. This is our very first variable. You can change the value of the variable. It would be like grabbing that apple and, and like plucking it from the box, putting it somewhere else and putting something else instead of it in the box. So it's the equivalent of that. I could change it. To, I could change that apple, substitute it for an orange. 
And now if I just copy this line, put it right here, Apple, uh, the variable name, the variable was referring to Apple, now it is referring to Orange. Cool. This was the third lesson. Let's talk a little bit more about JavaScript data types. Data types are really important to know what kind of stuff you can do with a language. All right, that's why data types are important. I think I could provide like it's something like this. So you know where every new lesson starts. I'm gonna copy this, put it on top of the lesson number three and copy it, put it on top of lesson number two. Now you know where every lesson starts. You don't have to really pay attention to it. Okay, so in JavaScript, we have several data types. We have one data type to store strings like this, like this apple was a string. We also have uh, numbers that we can store in elements. But in JavaScript, everything is which is a number is just a number. You don't worry about whether that is a floating point number or a whole integer. You don't worry about it. JavaScript treats everything uh, in a very nice manner. You're going to have a smooth experience when working with numbers in JavaScript. Now, let's create a variable. And I'm going to say uh, the variable is going to be... Uh, let's say it could be age, uh, which is very uh, overused. I'm, I'm going to go with grade, and I'm going to set it as 95. Cool. And I'm going to say console.log. Let's print out grade. And we can see it says 95, but the color is different. For strings, if I comment these two back in, we had white. This is because 95 is a number. There is an operator in JavaScript that gives us the type of data in that we're working with, and that is console.log uh, type of, and then you provide the identifier the, for which you want to find out the type. If I do grade, it's going to give me number. If I do fruit from the above, it's going to give, give me string. We are going to talk about operators more. Don't worry about it. This is just an example. Cool. I'm going to comment these ones out as well. Uh, let's uh, take a look at an example of a floating point number. I'm going to say let score is going to be equal to like 9.8. And then you can basically say console.log. You no longer write 9.8. You, you grab its identifier. And you can use this identifier anywhere that you want. And you can see 9.8 still blue, which is which signifies that it is a number. Everything is making sense so far, right? It's very easy, very simple. We are uh, taking it one step at a time. Next up, since we talked about numbers, why don't we talk about some arithmetic operators next? I'm going to copy that line, put it right here as well. Cool. You can do arithmetic operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division with JS as well. And for that, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to try to keep it as real world as possible. So you can actually connect the dots and you can reuse it wherever you want. Now, uh, we have arithmetic operation. Anything that performs that arithmetic operation is an arithmetic operator. And this S is that uh, plural S, like several operators. An, uh, an operator performs some kind of operation on operands. An operand is something that is on either side of that operator. A lot of technical stuff. Let's jump into coding. So let's say we have a math grade, which is set to 90 for a student. And let's say we have a physics grade, which is set to 95. Cool. And then we have a chemistry. Great, cool. This is set to 85. Cool. Now, uh, before moving forward, I need to give you a little bit um, uh, uh, something on the naming of your variables. You can see that we have math and then grade. Math is one word, grade is another word. JavaScript is actually camel case. It means that when we create variable names, we don't provide spaces between variable names. We don't separate them using hyphens, nothing. We just write them all together. And for readability purposes, starting from the second word onwards, 
We are going to grab uh, the second word, the third one, and so on. We are going to grab the first letter of these words and capitalize it. The first word is going to be written in all lowercase. But starting from the second word, we are going to capitalize the first letter. Keep that in mind. Only the first letter, not the entire word, just the first letter. So if I had math grade, I don't know, like Mike, you can see that Mike, the M is capital. And then if I had another thing at the end of that, then that would be capital as well, the first letter of it. This makes reading the code a lot easier. Okay, now that we have all of this, let's take a look at the total grade. For total grade, I could do math grade plus, plus is the addition operator. And I could do physics grade. Now, this plus, it performs an operation on operands. Math grade, which is on one side of the operator, and physics grade, which is on the other side, both of them are operands. Very simple. And then I'm going to say uh, chemistry grade. There we go. Now we have actually ad added all three of them together, but we have no way of using that data because we did not store it in a variable. So let's store it in a variable, and I'm going to call that variable total score or total total grade since grade is second word i'm going to say g capital and then the rest lowercase and you can see this equality sign this is an assignment operator so in this line what i've done is i've said math grade plus the physics grade plus the chemistry grade the result of all three of these should be assigned to the total grade that's exactly what I've done. So if you understand this concept, you basically can understand anything in JavaScript. These, this, like the simplest operator, this assignment is actually an operator. It assigns the right side to the left side. Cool. How can we take a look at the value of total uh, grade? The value for total grade is 270. When you do console log, you take out the value for it or what's on the right side of the assignment operator. Cool. So we took a look at the uh, addition operator. Why not take a look at the division operator? Let's say we want to grab the average, average score. And you know how we can take average. So for average, I could do total grade divided by three. And this for this thing that looks like a forward slash, this is actually the division operator. And then I'm going to store it in a variable. Let uh, um, I could do a v uh, a v e grade average grade would be total grade divided by three. And I'm going to say console dot log a v e. Uh, great, and it's going to be 90. We know that. So, so far we have taken a look at two operators. Let's take a look at another example. I'm going to comment out all these. Let's say we, we are giving out loans, right? And the, um, the situation or the criteria for giving out a loan would be that, um, you know, that, that example is a little bit too complicated. I'm going to simplify it. Let's say uh, there is an amount that you loan from a bank. So I'm going to say let, we're going to keep it simple. Loan amount, so far so good, right? So let's say we have a loan amount. This loan amount is $1,000. And let's say the bank's interest rate is 15%. Cool, 15%. That's awesome. Now, first thing that I want to do is I want to find out the interest amount. So 15% of $1,000. How much is that going to be? I'm going to say interest amount is going to be equal to. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the loan amount and I'm going to multiply it by the interest rate. This is going to give me the interest amount. Let's take a look at it. Cool. Um, there we go. This is just an example. This may not be actually financially correct, but this is just an example to get you started with 
uh, operators. So it's $150. Now what I want to do is I want to find out the net loan amount. So $150 from this 1000 I have to give back to the bank. So my how much is going to be my net loan amount? So I'm going to do net loan amount. And you can see the camel casing there. It's going to be loan amount minus interest amount. And now this is an example of the subtraction, and this was the example of multiplication. And we can take a look at it, console.log, uh, net loan amount, let's save it, this is 850, cool. So now that we are done with the uh, operators, let's take a look at the string type. Uh, we have taken a look at an example of a string, but we have not studied it in the context of a string data type. I'm going to grab this line, put it right here. So strings. Strings are basically words that we provide them to variables that we can use anywhere that we want. They're basically words. So numbers are numbers. Strings are words. It could be one word or it could be like several words, like one sentence. I'm going to say let first name, first name, is equal to Muslim and then I'm gonna say let's console log it let's take a look at the first name in the console we can see there is Muslim and then I'm gonna create another variable that is gonna be last name which is Hilali and I'm gonna say console.log last name save that and is Hilali let's say I want to say I want to point to the console Muslim Hilali first name plus last name how would we do that I'm going to create a variable and I'm going to say full name. I'm going to do it exactly like I added the numbers, first name plus last name. So you can use uh, operators on strings as well. It's just going to put them together. That's it. And console.log full name. And when I save it, it's given me Muslim Hilali, but it's not, there is not any space between the first name and the last name. So what I could do is, I could just concatenate a white space there. This is an empty string and I'm gonna press space that is gonna give me like one space between them. And there we go, now we have one space there. This is so far everything you need to know about strings. We can work with strings. Let me copy that part, put it right here. This is gonna be lesson number seven. The next data type that I'm going to cover is Boolean data type. Uh, now numbers could be anything. It could be one to infinity. So there is not like this or the other, right? Two values. Strings could be anything as well. But Booleans, they can't be anything. There is just two values for the Boolean data type. And it is very straightforward. It's true or false. It is this or this, or it's this or the other. So it's, it, it just has those two use cases. Now let's take a look at, a, at an example of a Boolean. For example, I'm guessing that that student has passed. So I'm, I wanna create a variable that is gonna basically say the student passed is equal to true. So if a student has passed, I'm going to say true. If, it, if they have not passed, I'm going to say false. So passed is going to be equal to true. That's it. This is the true Boolean value. Keep in mind, it looks like a string, but it is not a string. We don't surround it by quotes. You strings, we put them in quotes. We could do single quotes. We could do double quotes. Or we could do backticks, which are template literals. Uh, but this is just a boolean. That's why we are not going to put it in, in quotes. I could do uh, console.log, show, show it to you. So if I say passed, save it, you can see it says true. If I take a look at the type of passed, what is the type? Type of, and it is going to show me a boolean. So we either have boolean true or boolean false. You could say it's like very, very straightforward. I could show you the false as well. Let fail since the student has passed. This is not a good example, but it's, it shows you 
true and false. If the student has passed, then the, fa the failed is going to be false. It's like that switch on and off. That is Boolean. I'm going to copy both lines, uh, put them down here. Uh, let's do failed. Okay. Failed. There we go. Let's save it. We can see it says false, and the type of failed is Boolean. This is everything so far you need to know about Booleans. Let's move forward. Okay, whoops. I just copy, save it there, grab these two lines, put it right here. Uh, next up, I'm going to talk about logical operators. Logical operators, they beautifully uh, demonstrate the use case for Booleans. That's why I'm going to talk about them. Now, logical operators, they um, operate on operands. They perform some operations based on logic. Everything in programming is based on logic, but these are like really logical. There are three types of logical operators. We have the logical AND operator, the logical OR operator, and the logical NOT operator. Now, a cool way and a simple way of understanding operators is that the logical AND operator, A and D, is exactly the AND word that we have in English. It's exactly the same thing. So I, I say apples and oranges. Cool? This is like an English sentence. And logical operator AND logical operator does the same thing. It combines these two. It takes a look at both of them. The logical OR operator says this or this, right? I'm saying, okay, do you want to go now or later? That's like a sentence, questionnaire in English. So or could be this. Do you want this or this? That or is the same as the logical operator. And not is basically the same thing as well. Do you want it or not? That not is the same in English, the same in JavaScript. And if you understood what I just said, you basically understood logical operators. Let's take a look at them. Uh, let's create a multi-line comment. We have the logical AND operator. The symbol for logical AND operator is double ampersand in JavaScript. Then we have the logical OR operator. The symbol for it, I'm going to be changing these uh, arrows right now because they look like arrow functions, which is going to confuse you when we get to arrow functions. The symbol for OR is double pipe. Uh, on some keyboards, it's on top of the Enter key. On some other keyboards, I don't know where it is. You can just check it online. And then we have the logical NOT operator. The pipe character, it's on the key that is the backward slash or the reverse slash. It's on that key. If you hold Shift and press it, it's going to give you like one pipe. And this is basically an exclamation mark. These are the three op logical operators that we have in JavaScript. Let's take a look at an example uh, for all three of them. So let's say I have uh, that passed. The student has passed. That's why I'm going to set it to true, right? So this is passed true. And I'm going to say let light, uh, but light is switched off, so it's not on. That's why I'm going to set it as false. Light bulb, I think. And then let's also create a number. Uh, I'm going to say great is, I don't know, like um, 90. Cool. So we have, we have two booleans and then we have a number. Now, depending on what kind of data is within that variable, the type of variable can be, um, can be uh, actually found depending on what is the type of data in there. So the type of this variable is a Boolean because it stores a Boolean. The type of this data is also Boolean, again, because it stores a Boolean. But the type of grade is a number because it stores a number. But if I store it like this, like if I say 90, now the type of grade is no longer 90. It is, uh, it's no longer, sorry, number. It is a string because I've surrounded it with quotes. Keep that in mind. So depending on what the variable is storing, the type is going to be different. Now, uh, let's evaluate passed with the light bulb, right? I'm going to say console.log. 
passed and I'm going to do double ampersand which is the and logical operator and I'm going to do light ball. Now the and logical operator, these logical operators, uh, they produce a Boolean value. They don't do anything else. They basically check whether something is true or false. And this is very, very powerful in programming because this is basically a, one of the building blocks of any kind of application. You check for a condition. If that condition is true, you run certain code. If the user is online, then the user can upload videos. If the user is not online, so it's one or the other, logged in or logged out, true or false, then the user cannot access their account unless they're logged in. If they're logged out, they can they can not access their account. If they're logged in, they can. So based on this true or false, you can come up with sophisticated software. And it is at the core of any kind of software that you can see anywhere. It is at the core of them because it's so important. That's why I'm focusing on it too much. Even though it's just two, like true or false, one or the other, but that is very important. Now, uh, the logical AND operator, it returns true if both sides or both of the operands the value for both of them is true. Now we can see that past is true, but light bulb is false. So this one is going to return false for us. But if I do, for example, this, if I do like this, console dot, not constructor, if I do console dot log, for example, this past is for one student and this past is for another student. And now when I save it, you can see it gives me true. Why? Because on each side of this AND operator, both of the operands return a value of true. That's why this logical AND operator, it produces a true value. Cool? So this is how logical AND operator works. We can also check it with numbers. So I could do console.log. Uh, I'm going to check. I want to check that the grade is greater than 90, 90, all right? If the grade, let's set it to 95 for this specific example. We are gonna check when the grade is greater than 90, 90 and when the, if the grade is less than, I don't know, like 100. And if I save it, this is gonna give us a true, why? Because grade is 95, on this side, grade greater than 90, this is going to return true. So I'm just going to pass in true here. And grade is less than 100, this is true as well. So when both sides are true, this is going to return true for us. Cool. Okay. And this greater than sign and less than sign, these are actually comparison operators. We are going to talk about them as well in just a few lectures up uh, uh, ahead of us. We are going to talk about these comparison operators. And now that we know how the AND operator works, so let's take a look at the OR operator. The OR operator uh, returns true if at least one side of the operation has a value of true or has a value of truthy. We are going to talk about truthy and falsy values as well. Don't worry about it. So if I say console.log, and on the, in here, if I say past, double pipe character, light bulb, and if, when I save it, it's going to return true. Why? Because this actually returns true, but light bulb returns false. And this is the OR operator. OR, so you want this or this. For this operator to return true, one side has to be true, and that is there. If both sides are false, this is going to return false. It's not going to return true. And if both sides are true, like this, then it is still going to return true. So one side has to be true for this to return true. Cool. A lot of trues and false. Uh, light bulb. I could give you another example. Console.log. Uh, I could do this example, but I'm going to change it a little bit. And I'm going, to, I'm going to bring this number back to 90. And when I save it, you can see it has returned false. Why? Because we, it, here I am saying that 
Oh, oops, oops, this is the and. It should return true. There we go. Why it is still returning true? We know that grade is less than 100, but we know that it is not greater than 90. It is actually 90. So this part is false. This part is true. This is still returning true for us. And the final one, which is... Uh, the not logical operator, the not logical operator flips the value. So if something is true, it's going to make it false. And if something is false, it's going to make it true. Like what? So if I pass and passed, we know that we are going to get true. But if I add that exclamation mark at the start of it, and now if I save it, it is going to return false. Where is this useful? For example, you're going to say, until this situation arises, I'm not going to run this code. Then you're going to use a not operator. We could take a look at another example, like for, for example, light bulb is now turned on. And I'm going to say true. Light bulb is on. Uh, this basically flips the value. This is everything you need to know about logical operator. Uh, let's move on to the next lecture, uh, next, next lesson in this crash course. This is going to be lesson number nine. Now, you, I, I want you to pay really, really close attention to the following two lessons because uh, this tends to confuse a lot of beginners, this, the idea that we are going to talk about now. So in this one, I want to talk about the undefined data type. And what am I doing? And in the next concept, we are going to talk about, let's copy that, provide a space. The next one, lesson number 10, it's going to be the null data type. In some ways, they're similar. In some ways, they're different. And you need to know the difference. So let's say the user has, uh, we, have, we have social media, right? Or you have any kind of service on the internet, any kind of website that provides a service to the users. Nowadays, what happens is that there is a lot of this signing up or signing in with magic links. For example, if you go to any website, they say, okay, write your name, email, and create a password and then sign up. Or you can sign up with Facebook, with Google, with something like that. Uh, they are alternate sign-in or uh, sign-up or magic links. They're also called magic links. And they basically remove this headache of creating a password. Some websites do still require a password, but some actually, like, I have a couple of websites that I'm actually using myself uh, that when you sign in or sign up, or sign up, not sign in, sign up with a magic link, they're not going to even ask you for your name. Just go ahead and use start using their service. So in that case, when, when uh, the user has signed up using a magic link, the password will not be known. So in other words, the password is going to be undefined. Now, what is this undefined? Undefined is actually a data type, correct? And it means that we have created a password variable but we have not given it a defined value. So the value is undefined because we don't know it. We can also take a look at it, console.log password, save it. You can see it says undefined. And if I say console.log type of undefined, it's going to give me undefined. Cool. Now, uh, there is another way of actually ending up with undefined, and that is that when we define a variable, when we declare a variable, sorry, but not define it, what does that mean? It means that, let's say I want to have a variable called, um, I don't know, like uh, score. I'm just going to set it as score. You know, I have declared this variable, but because there is no assignment operator, I have not defined it. And if I take a look at this, now I, I have this variable, but I don't know the value for it. So if I just type in score, you see we get undefined. So this is the use case for undefined. Let's jump into null. Now null is actually an assignment value. And what does that mean? 
it is it it is assigned to a variable as a representation of no value now undefined it could be defined somewhere in the future for example I could say let uh, I'm not going to use let again I'm just going to do score I'm going to say score is equal to 10 and now if I take a look at the log score we can see the score is 10 it no longer prints undefined uh, I'm going to comment these two out so first it was undefined score because we declared it but we did not define it but now when we defined it it, it is no longer undefined it is 10 but null is when you don't know what the value for that is okay so the password might be might come in the future it might not it has a possibility right you could add that logic to your code base that even if someone signs up with a magic link they still have to create username and a password so in that case this password undefined value will be changed by the password that the user has created but null is different uh, I'm going to go over this one more time. In JavaScript, undefined is a type, whereas null is actually an object. We are going to take a look at that. Uh, it means that a, uh, it means a variable declared, but no val value has been assigned to it. But null in JavaScript is an assignment value. You assign it to a variable because you don't know the value for it. That is the difference between undefined. Undefined is the value that you don't know yet and you will know in the future. Null is something that you will never know. But you still want to declare that variable. You want to have it in your code base. Cool. Then you set it as null. Let's take a look at a couple of examples for null. I'm going to say let user image. I'm going to grab user image and I'm going to set it to null. You can use a website for 10 years and not upload an image to it. You can do that. So in that case, we do have the user image. We do have this variable, but it, this variable has no value. We know that for sure. But undefined is the kind of variable that we are not sure. We, we are certain that sometime in the future, we are going to have a value for it. But we know for sure that it doesn't have a value. There is no value for it. Then we're going to do no. This might not be the best example, but it uh, simplifies the process of understanding cool we can take a look at this uh, console.log as you create more and more uh, but at the same at the same time both of these are uh, the same thing as well it might seem confusing but you can use them interchangeably as well it doesn't really matter and you shouldn't get really hung up on all these small things in JavaScript and there is a lot of quirkiness to JavaScript and weirdness to JavaScript and as a beginner my suggestion for you is not to get hung up on it too much just remember it and in the, if you get to the expert level use it unter interchangeably that is okay as well so undefined lack of uh, undefined not knowing that value null lack of a value very simple so I'm gonna say user image and then Let's take a look at the type of user image. We are going to get an object. That's because it's an assignment value. But undefined is a data type. Keep that in mind. Okay, we are done with this weird discussion of uh, undefined. And you might not even ever use it in your career. This difference. But as a teacher, I'm obligated to teach it to you. That's why I'm doing it. <laughs> Uh, let's jump into lesson number 11. Uh, in lesson number 11, number, we're going to talk about the first data structure in JavaScript, which is the object data structure. Object data structure is also an object data type. Now, so far, what we have done is, if you want to store a word in JavaScript, you're going to store it in a string. If you want to store a number in JavaScript, you're going to store it you, in, as a number. But what if there are more complex data types? For example, you, there is a person, right? For example, your pet, like a dog or a cat. Your pet has a name, right? Uh, it has certain personality traits. It has certain features, like uh, certain physical features, like the age, the height, the weight, all of these, right? 
Now imagine storing all of this info inside of a inside of regular strings and numbers. How would we do that? We could do it, right? For example, the first pet that I owned, it was a dog, was like um, very, 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 I was very young. I was perhaps 12, 12 years old. It was around 18 years ago. So I'm 30 now, yeah, 18 years ago. Uh, it was George, the name of the pet. It was a pet dog. It was George. Cool. So let's actually define, um, uh, provide all the info of the George of my pet I owned 18 years ago uh, inside JavaScript. Let's say I want to create like a memorial app for my doc. So I would say the name is equal to George. Cool. This is cool. Uh, is it okay, George, G-O, I think that's spelled correctly. And let's say the um, uh, weight or age, I'm, I'm going to go with age. Age was like, I don't know, like two years old. I don't remember. So, and now we can see that if I were to console.log this, uh, if I just do, uh, come on, buddy, if I do name and then if I do age, and if I save it, it says George, and then it says um, it says uh, two. The age was two, or the age was five, whatever. But the thing is, that name is deprecated. Yes. Anyway, we are going to move forward from that. Now you can see that we have created two variables, but these, these two variables, even though when I created them, I created them in the mindset that both of them are relating to one another. But in our code, that is not being shown. They're not related to each other. So this is where an object com comes into place. I'm going to first write the name of the object. Objects, they, they store more complex data. So I'm going to say pet. This is my pet. And then for the pet, I'm going to write name. Let's first take a look at the structure. So, so far, everything is the same. For an object, the syntax is a pair of curly braces. When I hit enter, I'm going to write name. This is the key for an object. I'm going to set, uh, I'm going to create colon and then space. Every key is going to have a value. And the value for this is going to be this George right here. Let's copy that. Let's put it right here. And then you separate one pair of key value pair, uh, key values with a comma. The next pair is going to be H. Since two is a number, I'm just going to write it as two. That's it. And now you can see that we have actually specifically, I'm going to delete these as well. We have created a pet object. Inside that, we can have name. We can have age. We can have personality traits, other features. Whatever you want to add, you can add it here. And all of them are encapsulated in this pet object. Cool. Object is another data type in JavaScript. This is the most used data type in JavaScript. This is the most important data type in JavaScript. You need to keep that in mind. And there are some theories which are actually true to some point that everything in JavaScript is actually an object. And um, I don't know which lecture that's going to be. I, I think it's perhaps when we get to strings. I'm going to actually prove that to you, prove it to you that everything in JavaScript is actually an object. And I'm going to uh, show a preview of that here as well. So this is an object. And I'm going to say console.log pet. Let's save it. And you can see in the console, we get this object. And it says prototype. The type of it is an object. We have, a, we have age and we have name. Now, how can we select this data? When we did it, regular variables strings and numbers, we did console.log name and we got the name George. So how can I extract the name from this object and the age from this object? That's how I'm going to do it. There is a notation in JavaScript that is called the dot notation. And ironically, it is just a dot. And that's it. So on any object, if you do dot, it's going to pop up all the in this IntelliSense, you can see all the properties and methods available for that specific object. 
properties are like this, like name and age, they're properties. And if within the object you had a function, we are going to talk about functions, don't worry, then that function on an object is not called a function, it's called a method. And this is why everything in JavaScript, it's perceived that everything in JavaScript is an object. Because this dot operator, it only works on objects. Cool. So if I do pet.name, this is going to give me George. And if I do pet.age, it's going to give me two. And now you can see we have a systematic manner of storing complex data. That's um, everything that I'm going to talk about objects for now. We are going to move on and we are going to talk about the next data structure. Yes, we do have another one as well. Let me copy this, put it down here, uh, save this. This The next one is an array data structure. And now, why do we need to learn about arrays? Now, for, for objects, we know that we have key value pairs, right? Name, we store characteristics of something in an object, anything. It could be another data type that you want to store it in an object, but Let's say you want to store uh, five names in a variable. How are you going to do that? You can't do it uh, using a regular variable declaration. Like say, uh, I could do like five names. Uh, let's capitalize this one, five names. And then I'm going to do, okay, John. Um, and then I'm going to provide a comma. I'm going to do Jane. And I'm going to provide a comma and then, no, this doesn't work. So we need to have another data structure if you just want to store values, right? So if you want to store more than one, one value or more than one value, you're going to use an array. If those values, they also have keys that has to be stored with the value, then you're going to use an object. Now, values that are stored in an array, they do have keys. They're called index or indices or indexes, but they're not stored directly within that array. They're stored like they're like that um, abstraction layer. That's something that you don't see, but that is actually there. That is called an abstraction layer. So let us just take a look at it. So I'm going to say I have uh, numbers. I don't know. And these numbers could be like 1, 45, 65, 89, 69. There we go. So I have all these five numbers, right? And I'm going to take a look at them in the console. Uh, numbers. Save that. There we go. So you can see the syntax is different. For, for objects, we have this cur curly brace, but for numbers, we have this bracket, square bracket. And if I uh, uh, open this up or expand it, we can see the type is an array. We can also take a look at the type here as well. Uh, type of, I didn't do that for objects. I'm going to do it right now. So this is an object, <laughs> even though prototype is an array, but actually arrays are objects. Let me copy that. I know someone who really hates calling everything an object. I know that person. <laughs> and his name is Kyle Simpson. If, you'd, <laughs> if you watch his lectures, he hates uh, when people call everything an object. He really does. Kyle Simpson. Uh, so you can see that this is also an object and that is also an object. So uh, let's move on. Um, uh, this is an array. Cool. Now, how can you extract values from this array? That, that's going to get a little bit complicated. Uh, that and I'm not going to talk about it here, but because for now, what I what I'm what I'm trying to do is, uh, I'm just going to get you. I'm actually trying to get you started with, uh, and get you familiar with these kind of uh, data structures and types, data types that we have in JavaScript. Next up, lesson number thirteen, uh, we have uh, comparison operators. Very cool. Very very cool. Let's talk about comparison operators. That's going to be 13 and comparison operators. 
So comparison operators, they compare two values. Yes, that's how simple it is. So uh, I'm going to keep it very, very simple, extra simple or extra dead simple. And I'm going to create let first score. I'm going to set the first score to 85 and I'm going to set the second score to 95. And this is going to be second score. Now, in case you're wondering, if you uppercase the first letter of the first word as well, or basically all the words, they have uppercase letters, that is no longer called camel case, it's pascal case. But camel, camel is when the first one is lowercase and the rest of them is uppercase. So we have these two. Now you need to keep in mind that when we're talking about comparison operators, we are not reassigning values, we are comparing them. Even though their syntax might look a little bit familiar um, a, li a little bit similar to this equality sign that we have here. Okay, so first uh, let's take a look at the, let's check if two values are equal. I'm going to write these tests right here, checking if, um, if two values are equal, e equal. Sometimes my typing is really horrible. So if you want to check two value, if two values are equal, what you're going to do is you're going to say console.log and the uh, result that, I, uh, that a comparison operator produces is also a Boolean value. So I'm going to say if first score is double equality sign equal to second score. Again, I'm not specifying, I'm not changing the value of first score. A score. I'm not reassigning it. I'm basically checking whether they're both of them are equal. Then you're going to use this operator. This is the equality operator. This first one, this is the when there is one assign one equal sign, that is the assignment operator. When there is two, then that is the equality operator. Okay, let's save that. You can see it's false. Why? Because first score is 85, second score is 95. We can also check if two things are not equal, and then you know which one we are going to use, right? That not operator. Checking if two values are not equal. So how are we, how are we going to do that? Uh, this, this set, this operator says if two values are equal. But remember, we need to flip the value. And what, what is the operator that flips the value? That is the not operator. So I'm going to grab the first equality sign and I'm going to change it with the exclamation mark. And now this is going to check whether, whether these two are not equal. So what does that mean? In this scenario, if both of them are equal, then it is going to return true. If both of them are not equal, it's going to return false. But in this scenario, if the result of these two is true, then it's going to return true. Let's save that, and there we go. It is basically the reverse of this one. So a not operator is looking for when the Boolean context is false. When the Boolean context is false, it's going to return true. But this equality operator is looking for when the Boolean context is true. When it is true, it's going to return true. Otherwise, it's going to return false. Cool. Now, if I were to set the first score as 95 as well, then these two values will flip. Let's see. If, let's take a look at that. There we go. Because equality operator, it looks for the Boolean context. When it is true, it returns true. Right? For the true e Boolean con context. But the not equality operator, it, it is looking for the false Boolean context right? False. And when it gets it, when it gets that false, it's going to print true. And when it doesn't get that false, it's going to return false, right? It basically flips the value. It's a little bit counterintuitive, but this is how it works. We also have the greater than, less than, greater than, and equal to, less than, and equal to. Let's talk, talk, <laughs> let's talk a, lot, uh, a little bit about them as well. So, uh, I'm going to be copy-pasting these two values a couple of times. Uh, first, I'm going to check if something is greater than or if is less than. Checking if, two, if one value 
if first, if I'm gonna say one value um, is greater than the other, than the other, or than the other value, and then I'm gonna put that here as well, let's get rid of it, uh, is smaller. The greater than is this one. Uh, I need to, I'm gonna flip these, the, the, these two as well. So, you know what, I'm gonna keep it as, the, as it is, and this is the smaller one. Well, depending on your perspective, any one of these could be bigger or smaller. So, we are checking if first score is greater than the second score. It is not, that's why it returns false. But, if I check, that first score is smaller than second score? Yes, it is, that's why it returns true. And if you're getting confused, you can just comment out the previous console logs just to get to the point, to the result that you want. And now the other two, the final two is gonna be the same as these ones, is greater than or equal. So I'm gonna select this, uh, or equal to. Cool, and for that you're just gonna provide a, an equality sign. There we go, let's save that. Let's first take a look at this one. It's gonna return false because 85 is not greater nor equal to 95. If I set it to 95, it's gonna return true. There we go. Be oh, oops, 95. Because it's not greater than 95, but it is equal to 95. So in this case, we are actually chaining comparison operators together. The same could go for this one, and for this one, we will also see true. Why? Because even though first score is not less than the second score, it is equal to it. Cool. And now, let's take a look at null and undefined. Remember those? So I'm going to say console.log. Do we want to check out the value of null and undefined? I'm going to give you a couple of seconds. What do you think the value is going to be? It's going to return true because null and undefined are basically the same thing. Why? Because they represent, on a fundamental level, they represent the lack of a value. It doesn't matter how that value is lacking or how that value is missing, but it is missing in the, at the end of the day. So, you can see it returns true. This is what I meant by not getting hung up on these little things. It's, you can use them, uh, you can actually use them interchangeably, it's, it's okay. Because anyone who sees undefined or null, they will immediately know that there is no value. It doesn't matter why there is no value, because there is no value. So it doesn't matter why. Cool. Now let's take a look at another group of operators. They are strict equality operators. Yes, we do have strict equality operators as well. Uh, I'm gonna comment out these two lines. I hope you're not getting tired. If you are, this is just a video. I'm just talking through a video. You can always, uh, you can always pause the video and take a break. Okay, let's copy paste it here. That's gonna be lesson number 14. We just have to nine lessons and then three projects. Very cool so far. Now you are like getting familiar with how JavaScript works. Now, uh, what we did in, uh, in this, in the lesson number 13, in the concept number 13 was, we just compared the value of two, up, two variables, just their value. We didn't compare their type, right? We didn't compare that. Now, strict equality operator, as the name suggests, this has to be uh, the operator that you always use, never use the uh, comparison operators, this loose equality operator, especially these two, never use them, because they do not check the type of the value. Let's take a look at uh, uh, let's take a look at through uh, take a look at it through some examples to see what exactly it is that I mean that I mean. So if I say ten, uh, strict equality operator has three equality signs, and then if I say ten equal to ten, we are going to get true. Why? Because ten 
has a value of 10, which is equal to 10, and both of them have the same type. Both of them are type of number. But what happens if I say 10 equal to the string of 10? Now we know that whatever comes within quotes, that is a string. It doesn't matter where you write number, whatever. That is a string. But this is a number. Surely their values are the same, but is their type the same? No, that's why we get false. But uh, what, what about the loose equality operator? What happens if I use that? So if I just do, if I just uh, take out one equality sign, and if I save it, we are going to get true. Why? Because loose equality operator, it just takes a look at the value. We know that the number 10 is not equal to the string of 10. That is how logic works, right? But this is telling us that it, that it is basically the same thing. It's okay if you have a number 10 or if you have a string 10. But in fact, it is not okay. And why is that? Why do I keep saying it is not okay? For example, in that calculator app that I've created that I'm going to show you how you can create, let's say we have console log. Well, let's say the user says 10 plus 10. The user will get 20. But what if the user says, ten? okay, so based on loose equality, 10 is equal to the string of 10. But when I save it, oh, 10 plus 10 is 1,010, 10, 10. Why is this? Because it grabs the string of 10 and it puts it next to 10. I could change this, uh, this example. Uh, I could say 15, and I'm going to bring this to 15 as well. So 15 plus 10 is 15, and then 15 plus this 10 is 15, 10, 1,510. Is this okay? No, it is not. It's going to basically put your uh, throw your application in disarray. That's why we don't use loose equality. I, I taught you that because the idea is very important, so you know why you don't use the loose equality this is why you don't use it, because it's not correct. And if you're wondering why they've created it, I'm not sure. Uh, let's take a look at uh, some other examples. For example, the string of Halali. Is it equal to the other string of Halali? Yep, but because they have the same type and they have the same value. Now, this is the strict, uh, we have strict equality operator and strict equality not operator. I'm going to give you an example of that as well. Uh, that is when I just uh, substitute one of these equality signs with that not operator. And keep in mind, the not operator is looking for a Boolean context of false. And when it gets that Boolean context of false, then it is going to return true. Otherwise, it's going to return false. So if I say 10... We know that, this might confuse you further, but I'm going to do it just to make sure you understand. We know that 10 is not equal to 10. So the Boolean context of this operation is false. Keep that in mind. It is false. So when the Boolean context is false, what's the, what the not operator is going to return? It's going to return true. Save that. There we go. Because it's looking for a false, and we know this is false right from the above. It's false, but when you flip the value of false, what do you get? You get true. Again, it's just flipping the value. That's all it does. And what about our trusty favorite null and undefined? And this is where some people might argue that they're not equal because of this. And this is just a sneak peek of how quirky JavaScript could get if you dive too deep into this kind of stuff. But it's very, it's, uh, believe me, it's a very, very straightforward um, language. It's very easy to understand. Take it from me. I've, I've learned JavaScript in Afghanistan. I've studied it in here. And with the very, very, very little resources that I have, that I had and currently I have, uh, and it, it, it was not a big deal actually learning JavaScript. You need to like work a little bit harder because you need to uh, align yourself with the circumstances and circumstances tell you that it's against the morality of the bunch if you learn these kind of technologies. I hope you get what I'm what I'm saying.
Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to move away from this heated topic. So if I say null is equal to undefined, I am wrong. It's not. Because even though the value is the same, these two are fundamentally two different data types. One is, uh, a, one is undefined and the other one is null. They are different. Null is an object, undefined is, is type undefined. It is a specific type in JavaScript, undefined. Like number, like string, like boolean, undefined is a specific type. But null is not a specific type. It is an object. Okay? That's why their type is different. Their kind is different. But their value is the same. So, Strict equality says, no, -uh, they're not equal. Let's comment this one out. Let's talk about assignment operators. Cool. Everything making sense so far? I'm sure it does. Uh, let's put that here. Let's grab the assignment operator. Now, so far, we have talked about assignment operators and how we can use them and uh, and why do we need to use assignment operators, correct? Now, assignment operators, they're used to assign a value to a variable. The first kind of assignment operator that we're going to talk about is going to be the most overused of, of them all. And it is the one that we have already talked about. It is the simple assignment operator. It is just one equality sign. We can say let digit be equal to 25. And now I can say console.log digit and save it. We are going to get 25. We also have the increment assignment operator. So I'm going to name this simple assignment operator, AO. And then we have the increment assignment operator. Uh, this assignment operator, let's say, I want to add 12 to this digit. So one way would be to grab the value of digit, to grab the digit and reassign it like this. Digit, sorry, digit, come on buddy, where is the D, uh, plus 12. This is one way, but this looks very, very long, right? We could shorten it by removing this digit from here Remove, removing the uh, addition operator from there and just adding it there. So these two are the same. Both of them are the same. This is equal to digit plus 12. So this is the increment assignment operator. We also have the decrement, multiplication, and division. The logic is the same. They're going to work like this. So console.log. And now if I take a look at the digit, it's going to be 37. Let's um, uh, decrease a value from the digit, and that is going to be decrement assignment operator. And for that, let's say I want to uh, subtract the digit by 22, let's say. And now if I just console log it, save it, you can see so far, what is the value of digit? The value of digit is 15. We also have multiplication. So multiplication uh, multiplication assignment operator let's say digit now the asterisk asterisk or star times three and you know what this equal what this is equal to if you're not sure just substitute this uh, plus sign with the asterisk and then you're gonna know okay what that actually means cool uh, let's come down here and let's copy this value. Take a look at it. It's 45. And finally, the division assignment operator. So it's going to be division, division assignment operator. Keep that in mind. This is not an arithmetic operator. This is an assignment operator. Arithmetic operators, they have different signs. Digit divided by 5. And now if I take a look at it, it's going to give me 9. Okay? So far, so cool. Let's move away from these. These are very, very basic stuff. I'm going to copy this comment. Just paste it down here. 
next up, let's talk about if statements. What are if statements? Why do we need them? And why you should care about if statements? Now, if statements are um, for uh, if statements uh, are the kind of logic in JavaScript that actually control the flow of um, uh, application. What do I mean by that? First off, let me put in. Um, so let me take a look at my lessons. Assignment operator. Oh, this is lesson number 15. Sorry for that. And if statements is lesson number 16. Let me just copy paste uh, the name of the lesson. So if statements fall into a category that is called control flow and logic. So it, they control the flow of logic. What do I mean? So if something is true, and, and they do it based on Boolean context, and now you can see how Boolean is important, really, really important. So they say if something is true, do this. If something is not true, then don't do it. This is how you control the flow of logic. Now, uh, I'm going to actually uh, give you a little bit more info on this as well. Uh, you need to keep in mind that starting from this part of the crash course onwards and moving forwards, we are going to cover different parts of the JavaScript logic that controls the flow of an application. Now, for the first time in this crash course, we are going to talk about blocks of code that perform different tasks and mm, uh, allow us to create dynamic data with ease. Now, logic is the heart of JavaScript. You need to keep that in mind. It consists, uh, it, it basically consists of several parts, one of which is if statements. Logic constitutes any programming language on the planet, and it separates it from static code such as HTML. Uh, logic in an application determines why there is a need for the application to be built, how the application is going to be built, and uh, what are going to be the different aspects of that application? And what kind of data will it interact with? How the user will benefit from this app? And at the end of the day, does this app have the ability to be a source of revenue? I mean, that's why you're here, right? Now, control flow refers to how the application will react based on the parameters that we give it as developers. That is a little bit more technical. And how the app will change based on its interaction with the user. Okay? So how it is going to react to the parameters that we're going to give it and how it is going to basically evolve as the user is interacting with it. Now, the topics that we're going to study from this section onwards, they're very crucial. They require a lot of examples. And let's, without further ado, let's just get started. Now, let's talk about if statements. If statements run a block of code, if a certain condition is true. The condition could be anything, but it has to be evaluated uh, uh, true for the statement that is within the if statement if we want the code to run. And this is exactly how if statements control the flow of application. Now, uh, first, uh, I want to talk about checking for a single condition, checking for a single uh, condition. So what do I want to do? I'm going to say let eligible age, it could be age for anything, driving, drinking, whatever. I'm just going to say let eligible age be 21. Cool. And then I'm going to say F. Now first, when you want to learn something new in any programming language, you need to learn the syntax. And then you can basically, uh, uh, the data that you put within that syntax could be different based on what, you, what kind of application it is that you're trying to build. But the syntax is the same. What is the syntax? So the syntax is, for example, for a variable declaration is like let and then the identifier uh, identifier and then the value this is the syntax right i'm replacing the value this is the syntax for declaring a variable with javascript 
I'm changing the value to 21 and I'm changing the identifier to eligible age. Okay, this is how you manipulate syntax. But what about if statements? So for if statements, you write if, you open a pair of parentheses and then you open this declaration block and that's it. This is the syntax, I saved it, that's why there is a, an error on the console. This is the syntax for an if statement. Now we need to manipulate it the way that we want. So I'm gonna say if eligible age is greater than 18, and now you need, you know, and you can see it, how these different pieces of concepts that we have talked about, they actually come together and they try to create a complete application. So we talked about declarations, variable declarations, and now, and then we talked about Boolean, right? And then we, later on, we talked about comparison operator. This is a comparison operator, right? You know what that means. So if, it's plain English, if eligible age is greater than 18, what do I wanna do? So if you wanna do anything, when that condition is met, you need to put it within the block of that if statement. This curly braces, this pair of curly braces, they create the block uh, of this if statement. And everything, when the condition is met, everything that is in here, it's gonna run, depending on what it is. So when the condition is met, when the Boolean context returns true, what do I want to do? I want to do allowed to drive. And I'm gonna save it, there we go. It says allowed to drive. So 21 is greater than 18, so it's allowed to drive. Let's take a look at another example. Let's take a look at 20. It is still saying allowed to drive. You can see how it's important. So what is what part of the application it is that we're actually trying to control? Anything that is within the if statement, within the block of the if statement. What is within the block? It's the control, sorry, console.lock. This is what we're uh, trying. So normally, if you just put it in the global scope, we are gonna talk about scope, uh, it's gonna run no matter what. But if you put it in an if statement, if a condition is met, then it's gonna run. I'm gonna change this to 18. It says eligible age is, okay, oops, sorry. And it doesn't do anything, why? Because we have said only print to the console when eligible age is greater than 18. I could say greater than or equal to 18, but I'm not gonna do it here. I'm gonna actually copy this, put it down here. Because this is important and I want you to have it as a reference, I'm gonna keep it there. And now it's gonna say allowed to drive. But if I come down to, two, to 17, you can see it controlled the flow of application. It didn't let this console.log to print to the console. This is what if statements do superficially. Cool. And I'm gonna give you another example and that is checking for two conditions. That was checking for a single condition. Checking for a couple condition. <laughs> uh, couple, sorry for, I even wrote it. Checking for two conditions. So in here I'm gonna say if eligible age is greater than or equal to uh, 18, then print console.log uh, allowed, allowed to drive. But if it is not equal to or greater than 18, then we are gonna say else. So when all of the uh, if statement runs, or it doesn't run, then the else runs. So in any other condition, so one condition says 18 years old or above. So that falls, uh, what falls in, into that category? 18, 19, 20, 21, all the way to positive infinity. But less than 18 is where is going to fall, is what's going to fall within this else statement. This, this else is gonna catch whatever this eligible age cannot catch. This is gonna catch it. And it's gonna say console.log and you're gonna see it right away. Not uh, allowed to drive. You can see it says allowed to drive. And then if I reduce this to 17, it says not allowed to drive. So you're handling that logic. So when you, when you say, okay, 
they are not allowed to drive. Is it better to show them an empty screen or to show them a, a, a message so they know why they're not allowed to drive? This is better user experience, right? And that's why we use else. So anything that can't be caught within the block of if statement, it is going to be caught within the block of the else statement. Cool. Let's move on. Uh, next up, I would like to talk about something that is, this tends to be a little bit confusing. Uh, uh, that is also based on Boolean context. And that is uh, truthy and falsy values. Let me copy that, put it right here. Seven, let's talk about truthy and falsy values. Now, there are some values in JavaScript that, that act, that behave as a Boolean true, which are called truthy values. I mean, they're not Boolean values. They behave like Boolean values. That's why they're called truthy. Like, they behave like a true, true Boolean, but they're not true Boolean. Because in Boolean, we just have two values. We just have true and false. The rest of the values, they have different data types. They're not Boolean. Whatever they are, they're not Boolean. But they could act as a Boolean. Cool? So when they act as a Boolean true, they're called truthy. When they act as a Boolean false, they call, they're called falsy. These terms are actual technical terms that you need to remember, right? Now, uh, a little bit more info on this. Um, this, is, this is a very, very simple concept, and it is very, very vital if you want to understand and master if statements and switch statements, and if you want to master control flow and logic. These are very, very important concepts, very simple. So. A value is truthy if, uh, when, when it is evaluated, it is evaluated to Boolean true. Okay, so that value is truthy. And a value is falsy when it is evaluated in a Boolean context, it returns a false. So where can we find a Boolean context? The recent example of a Boolean context was that parentheses of the if statement. And that's what we are going to use for this example as well. Now, the, num the values that are going to act as falsy, they're going to be all values act as truthy except for the false, Boolean false, the number zero, uh, empty string, null, undefined, and NAN, which is not a number. They are going to act as falsy. The rest of everything else they're going to act as truthy. Okay, now let's take a look at this in example. I'm going to create the syntax of an if statement once more, and I'm going to give you one more idea here. I've been talking about Boolean context so many times, right? Now, the Boolean context's job is to produce a Boolean value. Whatever you pass in, it's going to produce a Boolean value for you. One of the Boolean contexts, one of the places that we can find a Boolean context is this, this uh, pair of parentheses for an if statement. This is a Boolean context. So whatever you put in it, it's going to evaluate it either as true or false. And it might be a shocker, but for most of the times, you're not going to pass in the Boolean, the actual true or false. You're going to pass in some kind of condition. That condition could be a simple string. That condition could be undefined. That condition could be a number. It could be anything. So the job of this context is to evaluate it in a Boolean manner, as though as a Boolean would do it. Like you might have seen the scenes in movies and, and in series like TV shows that when, they, when one person get, gets into trouble, they think, OK, what would the other person do? Then I'm going to do that. Okay, I, I hope if, if you've been watching a lot of movies, you know what I'm talking about. So this per pair of parentheses, they think, okay, what would Boolean do? What would a Boolean do? What would a, when, uh, what would a Boolean do? Then I'm going to do that. Okay, so that's why it's a Boolean context. This is how it is going to work. So what I'm going to do is first, I'm going to pass in the Boolean false. Okay, and I'm going to say, 
console.log. Now, this is our test. This is going to check for us which values are falsy and which values are truthy. Now, if the Boolean context returns true, we are going to call them truthy. If the Boolean context returns false, we are going to call them falsy. And we know if it is true, then it will be caught in this uh, uh, code of block. If it is false, it is going to be caught in this code of block. So no matter what, we are going to catch it. I don't know falsy if, if it has E or not. I'm just going to write it as it is. So now you can see this false is actually falsy. First, we're going to take, about, uh, uh, take a look at the falsy values. And when you remember the falsy, falsy values, the rest of them are basically truthy. So falsy values. The first falsy value is the Boolean false. And now let's take a look at zero. When I save it, you can see it is falsy. So zero is also falsy. It's not false, it's falsy. It means it behaves like false. Cool. And then let's pass in an empty string. Empty string, keep that in mind. Empty quotes. This is also falsy, so I'm going to pass it there. Let's put in null, because this is lack of value, right? So it is falsy. Null. Uh, let's pass in undefined. Un undefined. Let's save it. Falsy. This is still falsy. Undefined. Very, very cool stuff so far. There is one value that we have not talked about it, and I'm going to talk about it, and then I'm going to comment this one back in. And that is NAN. NAN is actually a number. Uh, and it is produced uh, as a result of uh, in a mathematical operation that cannot take place. So the result of a mathematical operation, when it can't be a number, it is represented by NAN. For example, 10 divided by 0. Uh, it is going to give me infinity, um, 10 divided by string of 0. It is still giving me infinity. So, mm, so if I just say, hello, and now I get not a number. Because in math, we cannot uh, divide 10 by string, right? You can't say 10 divided by high. You can't do that. It has to be 10 divided by another number. Right? So when it can happen in JavaScript, any mathematical operation, you're going to get NAN. And it is very weird that NAN stands for not a number. This is not the weird part. The weird part is that even though NAN says not a number, its type is actually a number. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to let that sink in for a couple of seconds. Now, NAN is not a number, but the type of it is actually a number. This is one of the quirks of JavaScript. So this is not a number that is used to represent the result of an operation that can't be a number, but in fact, it is a number. Okay. So when you see this, this weird thing, it means that you have done something incorrectly and you, you have to go back and check it again. And this produces, I mean, of course it has to produce a falsy value. And the rest, everything is truthy. Everything, except for these six values. Everything is truthy. Even the string of zero, this is gonna give us truthy. Uh, if I do like 10, it's going to be truthy. The Boolean true is going to be truthy. Everything else is truthy. So you just have to understand that in JavaScript, only these six values, they're going to act, act or behave as a Boolean false. And the rest of values, they're going to act, the rest of everything, they're going to act as a Boolean true. So in case you want to check for a condition, right? So you want to check if a student has passed or not. Instead of creating this variable, let's say, let pass be equal to true. And then you're going to say, uh, okay, if you, no, not that is not a good example. I'm going to give it, give you a good example. You're going to check, okay, if passed is equal to true, then type in truthy. 
uh, is not defined. Let us define it. Let past is equal to true. And you say, okay, if past is equal to true, then you're going to pass truthy. Instead of doing all of this, you, you saw how confusing it was. Because I don't do it, you can just do what? You can just pass and past. Okay, it's, it says it's not defined. You need to define it. Sorry for that. Because this is, this is an identifier. This is not a, a JavaScript keyword. The reason that we didn't define anything from these six things here was because they weren't variable names. They, weren't, they were identifiers. They were JavaScript keywords. So I'm going to set it to true. And it returns truthy. So instead of saying if past is equal to true, you can just remove all of this and you can basically check for it. So if past is truthy, we know that past is equal to true. So it has to be truthy, right? But if past is equal to false, then it is going to act, it's going to be falsy. Why? Because you have specifically told it that it is falsy. This is one of the good things that when you want to work with this, instead of having that logical operate, that strict equality operator, you can just get rid of it and work with it like this. Okay, cool. Uh, I did explain a lot, uh, explain this a lot. I'm going to get rid of this. And I'm going to pass an N A N. Cool. Let us uh, get rid of, uh, comment all of them out. Next up, let's talk about switch statements. We already know how we can uh, create uh, if statements, switch statements, they also control the flow of logic, but in a different manner, okay? I'm going to copy this, put it right here. Uh, this is going to be switch statements. Copy it, put it right here. Again, switch statements, they also control the flow of logic. Let's see how. I'm going to take a look at the same example. I'm going to, I'm not going to say eligible age. I'm just going to say age. Let's say age is 21. Now, how can we create a switch statement? Uh, first, we are going to write, uh, so first you need to know the syntax. And when I hit on this, uh, click on that, it's going to create the syntax for a switch statement. Now, it looks a little bit more bizarre than if statements, but it, trust me, it has its, places. In fact, we are going to use it in one of our components. So first, we are going to pass in the key. This is what we are going to check in a Boolean context. And yes, these parentheses, they return a Boolean context. So I'm going to pass in H. So instead of F and else, we have cases. So we say case, we say F, okay, I'm going to explain it like this. If the age has a value of 21, then I'm going to say console.log allowed to drive, okay? And then I'm going to break out of this because if you don't break, then this case will be included in the next case that you try to create. So this is one case, and then let's create a next case. So the second case is, let's say the age is 18. What do I want to print in that area when the age is 18? So I'm going to say console.log. I'm going to say, for example, just for the sake of understanding, not allowed to drive. Save that. And then I need to break out of this. So it doesn't run into the next case. So when you say break, this case is going to end here, and then the next case is going to start. So now if I change it to 18, it says not allowed to drive. Okay, cool. These are switch statements. And finally, this default is like the else for the if statements. This is, so if any, if none of the other, they run, then this default is going to run. I'm going to say error, enter a... Um, enter an age and enter an age again an age again cool so when I say 20 since we have not added a case for it it's gonna run this message that error enter an age again and if I do whatever the case is so as long as it is not 21 and it's not 18 any other case it's gonna run that this is, this is 
everything you need to know about uh, switch statements so far. Next up, uh, uh, we are going to talk about ternary operator. Uh, the ternary operator also checks uh, based on a Boolean context, and it controls the flow of an application. It does it, but it does it very, very uniquely in a very short manner. So if um, you just check, you're just checking uh, if someone is allowed to drive, if someone is not allowed to drive, this is a very simple if statement, right? Uh, the, the typical if statement would be eligible age is equal to 21. Let's uh, actually take a look at the typical if statement. Uh, if you click on this, it's going to create that if statement context for you. So what is the condition? Eligible age, eligible, eligible age. Why is it not recognizing it? Cool. So if eligible age, we are going to say is greater than or equal to, greater than or equal to 20, I don't know, like 18, then we are going to say console.log drive or allowed to drive okay and then else is going to be uh, not allowed to drive not allowed to drive let's save that we can see age is greater than 18 it says allowed to drive there is something that it just crossed my mind that I have to explain and you can see because we are using um, the, compa the comparison operator here to compare two values, we can't just write it here, okay? We can't just get rid of it and expect, expect it to work. It's not gonna work, okay? We don't know what the actual condition is. If a condition is simple, true and false, you can just pass it there. And the reason that it returns truthy is because the value is 21. Let's say the value is zero. And now you can see it returns not allowed because this block is not running. Why? Because the value of this eligible age is behaving like a falsy value. So falsy value is Boolean false. That's why this block doesn't run and now this block runs, not allowed to drive. Okay, but in our case, we are actually ch checking, we are comparing values. We're not just checking true or false. We're checking true or false based on two values. So this is how a typical if statement looks like. But what if I tell you that there is a better way? There is actually a better way. So for that, I'm going to comment this part out. We're going to come back to these console logs. So I'm going to say, I'm going to grab the eligible age. It's plain English. If eligible age is greater than or equal to 18, then console log, you're allowed to drive. Otherwise, otherwise, that's why the colon, console log, you're not allowed to drive. Let's save that. That's it. Uh, the prettier actually like puts it on three lines, but this is actually one line. Again, if the eligible age is greater than or equal to 18, then print this one. When it is true, print this one. When it is false, comes after the colon, print this one. So you can see it says not allowed to drive. If I set it to 18, it's going to say allowed to drive. Very cool stuff, right? This is like a shorter way of writing uh, conditionals. Next up, let's go ahead and talk about for loops, another piece of awesome logic that is going to be used a lot in our applications. So this is lesson number 20. Uh, for uh, for loops, okay? Now, when you want to repeat a piece of code several times, you're going to use a loop. Very simple. For example, I'm going to say console.lock 0, 1, 2, 3. You can see how boring it gets, right? So instead of doing all of this, I can just declare a loop. So loop is going to repeat several times, okay? Now, what is it that we want to repeat first? 
let's take the uh, take a look at the syntax of the loop. This is there is a lot of stuff here. Don't worry about it. I'm gonna get rid of this. This is not important for us for now. So first, what do we have is the loop initialization. That is this part. This is the loop initialization. Then we have the uh, condition, which is this part. And then we have the final expression. And here is when the code runs. Again, initialization, condition, final expression. So how does this work? Instead of writing index, 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 I'm going to shorten it to i, which is actually something, this is a common convention. So I'm going to say, because loops are used with arrays, that's why by default you're going to see array dot length. But I'm going to say 10. So what I'm saying is, uh, I want to create a loop that is going to print numbers 0 to 10 in a, in a logical manner without me having to repeat myself 10 times. And then I'm going to say, so uh, we first initialized the value of i to 0. Then what we do is we check for a condition. And as long as this condition returns true, the loop is going to run. And the loop is going to stop running when the condition is false. And we want to provide a, one, a kind of condition that is false at some time, at some point uh, in time. Why? Because if the loop runs forever, then our system might be rendered unresponsive. You might have to restart the computer or you might not be able to work with your Chrome for several minutes. So you need to take a look at that, keep it that in mind as well. You need to avoid creating infinite loops as much as pos possible, okay? So i is initialized to zero. The condition says that i is only allowed to go to less than 10. And then after each iteration, we are going to increment the value of i, okay? So, the loop has a variable. I is the, think of it like this. I is the loop agent. The loop agent's job is what? To iterate over something. By iterating, I mean is show one value each time the loop runs. So each time the loop runs, it runs a certain piece of code. And that, uh, this entire thing is called one iteration. So the loop runs, then the code is shown, or the code basically executes, and then one iteration is completed. In the next iteration, the loop, uh, the loop runs. If that condition is true, the code is executed, then we go to the next iteration. This is, this is what iteration means. In every iteration, we execute the code. What is the code? In this case, let's just say console.log, let's just take a look at the i. And when I save it, you can see immediately, we get zero to number nine, not including 10, of course. Okay, so every time, so what actually happened here? We said i is equal to zero, so zero was passed right here and it was printed. But before being printed there, it has to be evaluated against the condition. Is zero less than 10? Yes, it is less than 10. So we print it and then we increment the value of zero by one. Now zero, now i is no longer zero, it is one. And then we check it against this condition. So this let i equal zero, it just runs once and that's it. You don't take a look at it again. And the, uh, the only thing that is being checked every time the loop runs is the loop condition. So now i is one, uh, one is still less than 10, we print it and we increment i to two, we check it against this condition, it is okay. True, we run it all the way to nine. So when the i number, our value for i is eight, we check it against this condition. It is okay. We run it and then we increment the value. Okay? So the value of i from eight, it went to nine. When I check the i against this condition, it is still true. Nine is less than 10. I run it and I print it. Why is 10 not here? Because when I increment i by 1, it becomes 10, right? Because it was 9. So 10, if I pass in 10 here, is 10 less than 10? No, it is equal to 10. That's why this condition returns false. And that's where the loop is terminated.
Cool. This is why we do loops. And this is everything that a loop does. I'm going to keep it simple and I'm going to move away from this discussion. Okay. This is loops. We do have another kind of loops. That is while loops. While loops are not that common. They are used. But more often, uh, it's for loops that are used, okay, in applications. But uh, um, ironically, while loops, they, provide, they explain the looping behavior way better than for loops. And what do I mean by that? So, lesson number 21, we are talking about while loops. Uh, so, let's first uh, uh, take a look at the syntax for a while loop. This is the syntax for a while loop. So while a condition is true, we are going to run some certain code. So instead of this for, I'm going to say uh, code runs. Cool. Now, the while loops loop agent is not declared within the loop like this i like this i variable which was declared within the loop. It is declared outside the loop. So i is equal to zero. That is cool. That is very cool. Uh, this basically says reference error. It's, it can't reference anything because the, it, there is no uh, condition defined. We're going to define the condition. So what is the condition? The condition is i as long as i is less than 10. The same condition, right? But the representation of the code is different. For as long as i is less than 10, what do I want to do? I want to say console.log. And I want to print i. Okay, let's save this. And you can see now I have ended up with an infinite loop. You can see it just keeps on running and running and running. And now let's see, it's going to basically take down my computer. Oh, I thought it was, come on, buddy, let's go to task manager from here. Where is, uh, ha <laughs> Whereas Chrome, let's just say n task. Is it okay? Okay, memory is running hot. Just, okay, let's just put it right here again. Is it okay? Yeah, there is no Chrome. Let me open it up with live server. Okay, there we go. I need to, oh, sh shoot. I did it again. Because uh, this is actually running, we didn't provide a, a final expression. And now I've ended up with an infinite loop. Cool. And I'm going to open it up with live server one more time. This is okay now, I think. It should be okay. Come on. Close it. Go to inspect. This is not the inspect for this page. Uh, you know what? I'm going to comment out that one as well. Just cut this one as well. Save that. Let's, let's save it. Let's open it up with live server. Everything should be okay. Yeah. Everything is okay. So you can see how troublesome it could be if you don't pay attention to what you do in coding. Now, this is the initialization. Uh, where this uh, this is the condition and this is the code that I want to run but where is the final expression here is the final expression I plus plus that's it so this is way better than that uh, what is happening here okay there is there should be in that comma there we go we basically get the same result but what is happening here? It's This is very, way more intuitive than for loops if you want to understand how loops work. So we declared the value of i and we given it a, a variable i and given it a, a value 0. And then we check it against this condition. Is 0 less than 10? Yes. Then we run the code and then we increment it. So now 0 is 1. We check the value of 1 in this condition. It is true. We run the code and then we increment it. We do this this uh, this several times until we get to the final, which is nine. Nine is going to return true from this Boolean context. We run the code and we increment it. So now when we increment nine, what do we get? We get one. Uh, sorry, we get 10. We increment it by one every time. 10 is not going to hold true in this condition. 
It's going to return false. That's why the code is not going to run. I told you this is way more intuitive than for loops, but for some reason, uh, for loops are used more often. Okay, let's talk about the next concept, which is really, really cool, and that is finally we are where the a programming language is born functions. This is the heart. This is everything a programming language is about functions. Now, functions allow us to reuse code and logic and avoid code repetition. Okay, so a function is a block of code that implements logic by performing a specific task. We have already been talk, uh, we have already looked at a function so many times, and that is the log. Log is actually a function. What does it do? It prints something to the console in this in, in our scenario, right? So this is actually a function. And log is not the only function that is available on console. So if I do console, and when I do the dot operator, since console is an object, you can see we get all of these functions. And when you see this cube, this purple cube, it means that it is a function. For uh, properties, it's a blue, I don't know, cube, whatever it is. So if I do log, we have already talked about this so many times, but we also have console.warn. I could say security breached and save it. Yeah, you can see it's a warning, security breached. So these are also functions. I'm gonna delete this console.log since we have done it so many times. I'm gonna keep that warn. But, um, the actual function declarations are a little bit different, okay? So first, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna give you the syntax for a function, and I'm gonna click on this. This is the syntax for a function, and I'm gonna explain the anatomy of the syntax. The first word that you can see is the function keyword. This is used to define a function, like let. We used let to define a variable. Function keyword is used to define a function. In Python, we use def, def, to define a function. The second part is this word is the name of the function. In this case, I'm gonna say my name. This is a function that is gonna, uh, let's say it's gonna return my age, so you don't confuse it with the name. Uh, my age, cool. Then we have this Parentheses where the parameters for the function come into play. The parameters for the function are the data that are going to be passed into the function when we call a function. So a function is not like any other piece of code that is going to be that is going to run when you just create it. No, you have to call that function. And calling a function is where the usability of that function comes into picture. So for this function, I'm not gonna have any parameters, they're optional. Uh, you could have parameters, you could not have any parameters, right? So I'm gonna say my, uh, my age is gonna be let age equal to 30, and then console.log uh, age. I'm gonna save this. Now you can see there is nothing on the console, why? Because we did not call the function. Calling a function is also, so I'm gonna write it, call a function. This is equivalent to invoking a function. If you hear it, some people say it's like fancier term. Invoking a function, also executing a function, okay? So all these three are the same. You wanna execute a function, invoke a function, or call a function. This has to be uh, continuous as well. There we go. So you need to call a function, think of it like this. A function is asleep, you need to call it to be able to get it to work or get it do something. Now, calling a function or invoking a function or executing a function is done through these pair of parentheses. Yes, it is done through this. Uh, but which function it is that you want to call? If I save this, this is an error, 
because it says it's a syntax error, right? Because I don't know, I'm, I've not specified which function it is that I'm calling. So in a typical application, you might have hundreds of functions, okay? So which function or which of those do you want to call? I want to call the function that has a name of my age. And now you know why the functions must have a name. So you can call them by that name, okay? Cool. So the function says, console.log age, which is 30. Now, let's say I want to repeat this several times. I want to say, okay, console log age like 30, 33, 33, four times. Now, instead of repeating myself, uh, instead of repeating myself several times, I'm just going to repeat the function call. And you can see we have three. And you can just repeat it as many times as you want. This, is, this doesn't showcase the best a usage or use case for a function reusability, but I'm going to give you another example, okay? So let's say we have, I shouldn't say okay too much. Uh, let's say we have, we want to like add two numbers together. Okay, again, okay. Uh, let's say we want to add two numbers together. How would we do that? First, the name of the function Keyword spelled correctly. This is the function keyword. And then what is the function name? The function name in this case is going to be addition. Addition. Cool. Now, I'm going to be passing parameters. Why? Because I want to show you why functions are reusable. Uh, so the first parameter is going to be A. The second parameter is going to be B. And then I'm going to grab a, uh, these two variables these two parameters, and I'm going to store their addition within this result, a plus b. And then when the function is called or invoked, I want to show result on the screen. Now, so far, it doesn't do anything, correct? Now, how can we actually make this function do something? We are going to say addition, and we are calling this function. And now you can see it says n-a-n, why? Because it is trying to say A plus B, even though A plus B, they are parameters, we have passed them in as though they're strings. But they're not, they're not even strings because they don't have quotes. Now, a function parameters, function parameter also requires a function argument. Any value or any data that you pass in, uh, pass in, in the function name, when you're declaring the function, that is a parameter. But anything that you pass in within the function call is a function argument. These two are completely different. Do not confuse them together. Some people say they're, they're the same, but they're not. We have function parameters in the function declaration, and we have function arguments in the function call or function invocation. Now, the first one for A, I'm going to pass in 10, and for B, I'm going to pass in 20. And you can see it says 30. I could pass in 10 and 50. You can see I'm changing the values. This is how useful functions are. I could say 150 plus 1050. This is going to give me that value. We could uh, take it to uh, the next level. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to be keeping, should I create another function or just modify this one? I'm going to modify this one. I'm not going to uh, create another function. You, we can do this in a little bit cleaner manner and a little bit more practical and more uh, real world. Now, a function could have a return keyword as well. The return keyword for a function returns a value from the function. So far, what we have done is we have not returned any value from the function. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is the result, this result that I have within the function, technically, I cannot use it anywhere else. I can't. So how can I use that, that value from the function anywhere else that I want? That's where the return keyword comes into play. There are some stuff that you need to keep in mind when it comes to a return keyword. The return keyword, when it's done, it executes the function. 
sorry, it exits the function. What does that mean? It means nothing after the return keyword is going to run ever. Keep that in mind. And it is actually a good practice that your functions return something. So then you get that something and you use it somewhere else. That's one of the ideas behind a function. So what is it that we want to do here? We want to say A plus B. Okay? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and I'm going to basically simplify this. Uh, sorry, I'm going to, uh, yeah, I'm going to simplify it and I'm going to concise it and I'm going to convert it into a return key. First off, I'm going to get rid of this console log because I don't want to console log it within the function. I want to have access to it outside the function so I can console log it outside the function. And then instead of this let keyword, I'm going to say return result A plus B. But this could be cleaned up a little bit better. So the only thing that I'm returning from this function is A plus B. I can get rid of this result. When I get rid of this result, I can get rid of this equality sign as well. And I can just say return A plus B. I'm going to comment out these ones and I'm going to add another function uh, uh, call here. Now, how can we grab them? How can we grab these? If I say addition and if I pass in like 12.2 and for the other one, let's say 32.5. And if I save it, the function is returning a value, but we're not grabbing it. It doesn't mean that the function is not returning a value because there is nothing on the console. No, the function returned a value. We need to strategically grab it. How can we do that? I'm going to get this function call and I'm going to put it within a console lock. And then you're going to see the value. Console.log. That is not the proper way of doing it, but it proves my point. There we go. Now, what is the proper way of doing it? The proper way of doing it is grabbing the function call and assigning it to a variable like this. Let result be equal to addition. And then I'm going to say 10, simple, 20. And then, oops, I keep missing an I. Uh, Console.log result. Save it 30. Now, this is the reusability of a function. Now, I can use this result wherever I want, in any manner that I want. And this is what the return key actually does. Now, I said, I told you that after the return key, no code is going to run. If I just say console.log, hey, you can see that it is faded out a little because it doesn't run. Even though we are running the function right here, it doesn't run. I'm going to say after the return key, and I'm going to create another console log, and I'm going to say before. You, you saw how, how it got highlighted before the return key. And when I save it, before the return key runs, but after the return key does not run. That's because of the return key. And this is very useful, very, very useful. Now that we know what functions are, these are actually called, the way that I just created a function, this is actually called a function declaration. We can also create a function using something called a function expression. We can also create a function using something called an arrow function. We're going to talk about function, uh, function expressions now, and after this, we are going to talk about function declarations. 23. Now, keep in mind, it doesn't matter, except for one uh, exception, it doesn't matter which, which way you go. Function declarations have been created when JavaScript was created. So it was with JavaScript from the dawn of creation. Function expressions are newer syntax. Arrow functions, they're newer syntax. Some people completely avoid function declarations. Some people use, like myself, they have like a combo of a function expression, function declaration, and arrow functions. They're just different syntaxes for doing the same thing. The only difference that function declaration and expressions, the difference between arrow functions and the other two is that arrow functions do not have the this keyword which is something that we're not going to talk about. That is advanced JavaScript, object-oriented programming. If you want to learn more about it, you can always check my 
JavaScript course. I'm not going to talk about the this keyword in this crash course. This is just a crash course. That's the only difference. But as far as this crash course is concerned, all three do the same thing. Keep that in mind. Uh, let's take a look at uh, an example for a uh, function expression. And then after that, we are going to jump into a function declaration. Now, it is up to you which one you use. Uh, my suggestion is to try to keep your course, course uh, not course, why am I saying course, code diverse. So it's a good idea to use function expressions. It's a good idea to use function declarations. And if you're working with OOP, it's a good idea to not use arrow functions because they don't have the this keyword. You need to do function declarations. That's the only limitation. Let's create a function expression. A function expression is the kind of function that is defined as the value for a variable. So first let's create a variable. We are familiar with that. Let's say multiplication. This is a variable. So far so good, right? But uh, no, uh, where we provide a value, where we assign a value to this uh, variable, we are going to create a function. And now this function doesn't have a name. This is also called an anonymous function. Even though this multiplication technically serves as a name for it, but you don't provide a name here. Uh, the rest of the syntax is the same, just there is no name. And for this one, I'm going to do the cliche X and Y. Cool. Uh, let's say this function returns x times y. So we know what this function, uh, oh, the function keyword is incorrect. There we go. Everything is okay. And now I'm going to grab uh, uh, the result and I'm going to store it within this result variable. Let's call the multiplication function. Let's pass in 12 times 32. And now we are we can take a look at it. Console.log result. Let's save it. 384. Again, when a function is passed as a value to a variable, it's a function expression. That's it. That's the only thing you need to know. And now let's talk about arrow functions. Let's change it to this one. This is functions, get rid of this, and arrow functions. Again, all of these are, at, this, at the end of the day, all of them are just functions. There are some are um, uh, classic way of creating functions. Some are newer way of creating functions. Now, when in, like for example, in the year 2022, if you wanna create a function with a function declaration, it it doesn't, it doesn't mean that your, your code is not going to run. It is going to run. It doesn't matter which way you go. What matters is which one you find comfortable. If you're comfortable with function declarations, you can use that. It is a best practice. Use it everywhere. No one is going to point out any kind of flaws in your code. It's okay. But in my opinion, it's a little bit better. This is my opinion that uh, you keep on with if we keep on with the modern trends in JavaScript. Okay, it's, I think it's a, it's, it's a good idea. That's why I try to provide it. I try to uh, provide functions when I create applications uh, in all three kind of functions whenever, whenever I can. So I, I keep my code diverse. Uh, let's say we have a division variable. Arrow functions could also be defined as a value for a variable. Now, in arrow functions, the function keyword is gone. There is no function keyword. And I'm going to say uh, u and w. We have these two numbers. And then you're going to use this syntax. This You have to use this. This is to signify that this, in fact, is an error function. So this, uh, this sign, this symbol, this is actually a part of the syntax. And then we have that good old uh, function block. Now, in this example, what I want to do is I want to control the flow, of the flow of code as well. I'm going to say if uh, instead of u and w, these are, this is like a bad thing. 
if you're doing programming like these vague identifiers or parameters that we don't actually, no one will know what they are. Uh, so your code has to be very, very readable. And when someone takes a look at any piece of the code without going back and forth, they have to understand what that piece of code is going to do. Uh, that's why I'm going to change this to num1 and I'm going to change this to num2. I'm going to say if num2 is equal to if num2 is equal to 0, because this is a division and we know that we cannot divide by 0, otherwise you're going to get infinity, I'm going to say console.log uh, the divisor cannot be 0. And then I'm going to return from this if statement. Now when I return from the if statement, what I actually am trying to do is I'm actually returning from the function as well. So if it is zero, I'm just gonna show this message and I'm not gonna do any kind of operations. I'm returning from the function as well. And then, now, what if the uh, divisor is not zero? Then I want return something from the function that is num1 divided by num2. This is, so I'm gonna explain this one more time. This if statement is controlling the flow of our, our application. The flow says that if the divisor is zero, we are not going to do any kind of operation. What is that operation? It is this division. So this return is not going to run. But if num2 is not zero and it is any other number, this if statement is not going to run and we are just returning this from the function. Cool? Cool. Let's move on. I'm going to say let result be equal to division. This is how you call the function by the name of the variable. You could say this is the name of the function. And I'm going to pass in 10 and 2. Let's say console.log result. It's going to be 5. Cool. Uh, let's pass in 0. Let's see how that's going to work. If I pass in 0, we shouldn't see any kind of operation. And, and you can see it says the divisor cannot be zero. Okay. Uh, the reason that we get un, uh, undefined is because we don't know what the value for this result is. That's why we get undefined. It is actually coming from 365 from this line. Correct? But this, the divisor cannot be zero. It is coming from 356, which is this line. I'm going to comment this one out, and you can see it just says the divisor cannot be zero. This is how you can combine different pieces of logic together. Next up, uh, we are going to talk about another very, 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 very easy concept, but extremely important, and why uh, we don't use var anymore. <laughs> you have no idea what var is, and I'm going to explain it to you, scope. What is scope and why do we need to know about scope? I mean, isn't it like something else, some other thing that you need to understand? Like, aren't there enough stuff that you need to learn? No, there aren't. You need to understand this as well. So, scope. This is where we get to actually, a little, uh, like, take, uh, like, uh, like, take this level up a little bit, okay? This is where we talk about, where we get to the mindset of intermediate JavaScript developers. When we enter that mindset, when we talked about if statements right from uh, lesson number 16, but we are actually kicking that up a notch here. Scope. So what is scope? These are very important. These actually show you how JavaScript works. That's why these are very important. Scope is a place where uh, variables or a certain variable can be accessed. Uh, that it, it, this is used to understand where you can, you, you can access what kind of data. Can you access uh, data in another context, in another scope or not? Uh, there are three scopes in JavaScript. There is the global scope, uh, and it is the JavaScript file itself. This file, app.js, it has a scope that is the global scope. Anything declared in the global scope could also be accessed in the global scope. 
Like what? Like if I say let a, um, I don't know, like hobbies, uh, double B, is it double B? I could say like watching movies, okay, watching, no, that's not correct, there we go, um, walking, taking long, taking long walks, um, what else? What else do I like? Uh, napping. No, I don't like napping. It makes me cranky. So, watching movie. Why is it too difficult? I guess I never, I never think about it. Um, earning money. <laughs> I do like that a lot. So this hobbies array is declared in the global scope, and we can access it and the global scope as well. So if I say hobbies, there we go, we can access that. Then we have the function scope, which is also called the local scope, and then we have a block scope, which is the scope of let and const, welcome to ES2015 or ES6, the buzzword that you've been hearing everywhere, ES6, ES7, ES8. Let is actually ES6, this is the the almost like the biggest change in the world of JavaScript since the dawn of this language was ES 2015, ECMAScript specification, which was released in the year 2015. That was the biggest change in the JavaScript ecosystem, biggest one. And that introduced us to let. Let was not known before 2015. This is actually ES 6, this buzzword. That, that, that I'm sure you have heard a lot, or you're gonna keep hearing a lot. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about the global scope. Global scope, uh, this is where variables are defined in this scope, they can be accessed in the global scope and in anywhere else that you want. This is global scope. Global scope is the scope of this file, this JavaScript file that, that is open right here. I can use this hobbies in the, in the actual global scope itself, I can use it in a function scope. Uh, let's just do like, I don't know, like things. <laughs> and I'm gonna say console.log hobbies. Let's uh, invoke this function, things. And there we go, we are accessing it. And you can see it comes from line 376 from this line here. So global scope can be accessed in a function scope. It could also be accessed in a local scope. It could also be accessed in that local scope. So global scope is clear, right? This is everything so far we have done. Not everything, most of the things, they are global scope, but the variables that we specified in our functions like this variable, let results, this cannot be accessed outside the function. Function scope is also called uh, local scope. I'm gonna comment these ones out. Next stop, let's talk about function or local scope. The reason that uh, this is important is just, and I'm gonna explain that in, in just two minutes, uh, or you're gonna understand that through these examples. Uh, a function scope says that whatever is defined in a function, it cannot be accessed outside that function. Cool? So I'm gonna say function, I'm gonna do like a normal function. Uh, message and it says uh, let user uh, let's say the username is Sandra and it's gonna say console.log uh, I'm gonna use backticks backticks is also um, uh, some uh, a concept that was introduced in ES6 uh, backticks they also create strings but they can create strings that uh, that can accept values from other variables that can access the value of the variables. You can just say this is my this is my name. You can just do this or you can select the value or extract the value from this user. How can we do that? We use it we do it using something called template literal or template strings. And that is when I do a dollar sign and then curly braces. Now within this curly braces I can invoke a function I can run a for loop, I can, 
Um, I can select the value from the user, the value of the user, and I'm gonna just do it. And now let's call this function so we can see that it says, hi, Sandra. Now take a look at this one. This is user. This is a variable that was defined in a function scope. Now after the function is called, I'm gonna say console.log, and I'm gonna say user. And when I save it, whoops, reference error. You need to keep pay very close attention to the kind of error that you get. Syntax error is something that you have typed incorrectly. Reference error is something that the program cannot reference the value of something because it doesn't exist in that scope. That's why it cannot be accessed. Reference error, it means that something is not defined. Even though we have defined, defined the user right here, but because that is the scope of the function and only within that scope, that user can be found, that user's value can be accessed. It cannot be accessed out of that scope. This is how function scopes work. And then with introduction of ESX, we got another scope as well, and that is called block scope. The, a block scope is the kind of scope that is created using let and const. We haven't talked about const um, I could talk about them now here. Should I? Yep, I'm gonna talk about it. Uh, remember our very first, uh, our second lecture, a uh, second lesson, where we talked about this, this lesson. I'm gonna talk about const in this context. We said, let fruit be apple, and then we said, uh, now, after uh, studying too much, uh, like all of that JavaScript, this seems very, very ru rudimentary and pre preliminary, very difficult words, very simple stuff, right? Uh, I declared a variable using the let keyword, and then I changed the value to an orange. You can't do this. You cannot do this with a constant. Const and let, they create var uh, variables. Let creates a variable that can change its value, but const creates a variable that is a constant variable. You can't change its value. That's why if I change this to const and save it, you can see type error, assignment to constant variable. We are basically trying to assign to a constant variable. That is not allowed. Apart from this, there is no difference between let and const. That's it. Both of them are newer syntax. Both of them are hot in JavaScript. In fact, when we select stuff from the DOM, from HTML, we tend to store them using const. Why? So later on, we don't make any mistake. Uh, let's say you have uh, created this variable and set it to fr uh, fruit and set it to apple. 200, 500 lines later, by mistake, you change it to orange. With const, you're going to get that error. But with let, that error is going to pass, and in the prediction phase, you're going to get that error. And that's not good. So const gives us this uh, a basic uh, validation of our code. Like It's going to give us a little bit of type checking, uh, and that type checking is important so we don't end up with bugs in our application. Uh, let's talk about the uh, block scope. Cool. And I'm going to introduce you to var, the legacy of JavaScript, how, like, like before 2015, how people used to uh, create, uh, declare variables, they used, they used var. Okay. So, and this is actually one way to check whether a tutorial is outdated or not. That is whether that tutor is using var or not. Using var is actually a bad practice anymore because it's, it's not deprecated, but it's not a good practice to use it. I'm going to select, I'm going to create an if statement, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set it to true. So it, it is true all the time. We know that. I'm going to create a variable using uh, let, set it to 15. Uh, I'm going to create another variable using uh, const, Mm, I'm going to set it to currency, uh, which is going to be USD. Why not? Var, I'm going to create a variable using var. So var is another keyword that can create a variable for us. Salary, 
salary let's set it to 10,000 so far so cool I'm gonna say console.log uh, so this is because there are curly braces we are gonna see that this could be a this could be a scope this could be keep that in mind I'm gonna come back to that could be I'm gonna pass a num uh, this is currency and the other one is salary let's save that cool very cool we can access all three of them but what happens if I access num and currency and salary outside of this block outside of this block I'm not saying scope yet we're gonna come back to it uh, so I'm just gonna copy all three and I'm gonna put them here and I am going to go one by one I'm gonna start with num now that we know we can access it there, I'm just gonna comment that part out. I'm gonna say num. We can't access num because this is let. I'm gonna come back to because. These are three things which are basically one thing and I'm gonna come back to them. What about currency? Can we access currency? No, we can't access currency because let and const are the same in when we are talking about scope. But what about salary? Whoops we can access it this is the issue with var var is function scope what does that mean as long as var is used in a function it can't be accessed outside that function but when it is used in any kind of scope in any kind of block it can be accessed outside of that block and why is this a bad thing again you might change it by mistake you might change salary to 12,000 and you forget that you have specified it in this if statement and then you're going to end up with a lot of errors a lot of errors and a lot of bugs that's why var is no longer used and why is it that uh, this these let and cons they cannot be accessed because let and cons they create something called a block scope let and const they create a block scope so if you provide let and const in any kind of block they're going to grab that block of code and convert it to a scope and then they are going to be accessed only within that scope what do i mean by that let's take a look at another weird thing that you can do with javascript so take a look at this is it a function is it an if statement is it a for loop what is it it's nothing it's just a block it's a block of code is it a scope no why because there is not let there is not const if i do var equal to, i don't know like uh okay what should i do what should i do here why am i thinking too much um, i'm gonna say first name and i'm gonna set it to Sally is that correct or uh, Sandy cool Sandy now I can access that outside of there first name there we go Sandy it comes from line 409 this is not a block this is a block sorry this is not a scope because scope says something that can be accessed there but as soon as I change this var to let this is no longer just a block it is a block scope let and cons they create a scope of themselves and when I save it there we go it says reference error that is why it's a good idea to use let and const this error is not a good idea but this error is a good thing because this error shows you that you are referencing something incorrectly make sure to go back to your block and check that and fix that error before your website is uploaded cool so this is even though it's not an if statement it's nothing this is just a block of code let and const they convert it to a scope that's why it's called block scope because of let and const it's called a block scope and uh, if I just uh, show you that I'm going to keep this I could uh, go back can copy it down below change it to let it's not there is too many errors there I'm gonna comment this entire thing let's see uh, did we have a function here yep right here 
and I'm gonna do it like this. Now, okay, this uh, using let, it cannot be accessed. I'm gonna comment out the error. And even if I do var, you can see it, it, it's working okay. But if I try to access that, we can still not access it even using var. Why? Because var is function scoped. But let and const are blocked scope. What does that mean? It means when you declare a var when you declare a variable or define a variable using the var keyword, the var keyword is going to take a look at whether that block of code in which it has been defined, it has been defined, whether that is a function or not. If it is a function, then it is going to limit its scope where the variable can be accessed to that function. But if it cannot find a function, it can be accessed everywhere. Like this if statement, it could be accessed. Like this block, simple block, it could be accessed. So that's why we say var is function scoped. Var has a scope only and only when it is declared in a function. Otherwise, it doesn't have a scope. It can be accessed everywhere. But let and const, we say they're block scoped. Why? Because they don't care if the keyword is function, if the keyword is f, even if there is no keyword, they're going to create a scope based on the block in which they're defined. That's why if I just say let here, now let is not going to take a look at this. No, let doesn't care whether or not it's a function or not. Let just cares about these two curly braces. When it finds it, it's going to attach it, attach itself to it, and it's going to make that a scope. And you cannot access the value of let outside that scope to which the let has attached itself. You cannot access the value. And that is a good thing. Trust me. It is a good thing. And now I'm sure you have understood this topic that quite literally baffles even advanced developers. I'm sure you have mastered it. Now, there is just four more things that we need to discuss before wrapping this up. And uh, I'm just going to give you some methods or functions. Methods are basically functions that are available on objects. If, if any function can be available or is available on an object, it's no longer called a function. It's called a method. And I'm going to give you some methods for strings, which are really useful, some methods for um, arrays and objects, and then we are going to jump into DOM, document object model. And after that, I'm going to teach you how we can create those three projects with simple JavaScript. I'm going to give you like five seconds. I'm just going to take a sip of tea. All right. I hope you didn't hear the gulping. I tried to stay silent as, as silent as possible. First off, in lesson number, oh, come on. Why is, why is that happening? Lesson number 26, um, uh, the first thing that I would like to talk about would be string methods. So let's talk about that. Uh, string methods. Whoops. Got it. Put it right here. The first method that I would like to talk about is how to get the length of a string. I am going to paste this test string, and I've uh, declared it using const. Now you know what const is. Uh, and now let's see how many characters are there. That is going to give us the strength, uh, sorry, the length of the string. And that length is actually property. I'm going to say console dot, uh, not assert, console dot log. I'm going to grab the test, and I'm going to hit that dot button, you can see this cube, this is like horizontal cube, which is blue. This is the property. And this purple one, these are all the, um, uh, the methods that are available on strings. And that's why everything in JavaScript is actually an object. And if I do length, so there are 37 characters in the strength, uh, in the string. You can uh, get um, any kind of 
specific letter. You can extract any letter from here as well using the bracket notation, uh, which could also work for erase. Basically, that is for erase. Now, you can select any letter from this string uh, using its index. Index is the number that is given to each one of these letters. And indices in JavaScript, they start from zero. So the first index, uh, the index for the first letter is not one, it's zero. Keep that in mind. It's gonna, it, it is like a gotcha, uh, but you need to, uh, and that's why, that's why you need to keep that in mind. So if I do zero, it's gonna give me I, because it is a good day to go out for a walk. If I do, let's say I want to get the index for this A. So how can I count? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So if I pass in six, we get A because indices start from zero. Keep that in mind. Uh, we can also get the last letter. And we could get it like this. I'm going to say test.length. Give me the length minus one. This is gonna give us the last letter. Last letter is K. Uh, we can also grab our string and uppercase it. Console.log, test.uppercase. It's gonna return that and it's gonna uppercase it. We can also lowercase everything. And for that to work, I need to modify this to day go and then walk save that there we go and i'm going to change it to to lowercase save that everything is lowercase uh, these are uh, these are these two are a little bit handy uh we can uh, get the index of a substring substring could be for example this good this good could be a substring i'm going to copy the comment put it right here because uh, these tend to get a little bit confusing, I'm gonna comment them out. And the rest is very, very simple stuff. Uh, how can I get the substring? I'm gonna do console.log, let's do test. So what is the substring that you wanna get the index for? I'm gonna do dot index of, what is the index that you, that, that you wanna grab? Let's say I wanna grab the index of good, and it is gonna give me eight. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and this is eight. That's, it starts at the index of eight. And uh, we can also, uh, if, and keep in mind, if that substring doesn't exist, it's gonna return minus one. That's what it is going to return. And, uh, let me also grab uh, the index of, it also selects, uh, it also uh, has another um, argument to it. So it either, come on buddy, uh, you can either pass in the search string or you can even pass in the position, okay? Based on this documentation, you can basically decode anything that you want. The search string is something that we passed in that was good. You can also say at what number, at what point you want that to be. Uh, what, what I mean by that is if I say A, if I save it, it's gonna give me position number uh, six, but I do have another A here as well. So I am going to pass in a position number 15 and I'm gonna save it. It means that start from this index and start searching from this index. Uh, even uh, uh, be, uh, we saw that the first A is at the index of six, but if I pass in 15, where is 15? So this was eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Right, it is gonna start looking for any A right after the day, right after the substring day. And when it finds it, it is gonna return the index of it, which is what? 31. So the index for this A is 31. You can, it's like limiting the search party. Uh, from, from this area to this area, you people just search this area and you people search this area. If you just do A, it means like search this entire land. Cool. This is limiting the search uh, area. Uh, another method is going to be includes. 
and it's exactly as the name suggests console.log uh, let's say let's say we want to check whether something is included in our string or not so i'm going to say test dot includes and i'm going to pass in that substring does our string include a true does it include b false it there is it is a good day to go out for yeah there is no b there but what about d does it include d true why because there is this d right here there is this d right here it does include it and you can also check for uh complete words like we and you're gonna get false and if i do uh good and i'm gonna get true perhaps i could do out these are very, very important when you're working with regular expressions. And that is when, for example, you create an email application and you want to grab certain, for example, an email address. You want to grab, extract an email address from that email that you have scraped from the internet. You can do that automatically, like systematically uh, with JavaScript. And that is something called automation. I'm not going to dive into that is way beyond the scope or even the scope of my Udemy course so that's like a very advanced topic but these are these, these may not seem that important now but as you um, get more and more experience with JavaScript you get more and more um, um, skilled in the in this JavaScript area then you are you're gonna know okay which one uh, why are these important and where I can use which uh, we can also split a string that is called uh, console.log. Uh, I'm going to say test. Dot, um, I'm not going to pass in test. I'm going to pass in another th string and I'm going to say hey and I'm going to split it. And you need to pass in something that you're splitting it by. So split, why is it not showing me? It should show me split split it's not showing me so i, I want to split it at an empty quote and an empty uh, uh, string and it is going to split it by each word sorry by each letter uh, oh sorry it has to be defined on the string dot there we go and now uh, i actually defined it incorrectly so it says separator what is the separate? I was looking for this word. What is the separator? The separator is an empty string. What does that mean? It means that it is just going to give me H, E, and Y. Very simple stuff. It is. Just, and now, what if you want to grab H, E, and Y separately? Like you want to grab H and then Y and then H and then E and then Y. You can do that as well. And that is, so this returns an array for me. Um, Let's see. Um, we could do that, this array. So let me think about it. So we have hey, split. If I pass in, this is the array. We could do it using the for loop. Hmm. So I'm going to change this a little bit. I'm going to save that first so you can have it as a reference. Let um, greeting, let's store it in here. And I'm going to say, set the greeting equal to hey dot uh, split, split it at the empty string. That is the separator. And then I'm going to use a for loop, uh, but uh, not loop, just for. Uh, it is a good idea to iterate over these things using the for each. That is the newer syntax. But I'm just going to, since we haven't studied it, I'm just going to stick with for loop. I'm going to say let i, which is the loop variable, equal to zero. And then uh, after it is equal to zero, I want the i to be equal to less than greetings. Uh, greeting dot length. We know that this is going to give us the length, and each time we are going to inc increment the i by one. If I do console dot log i, this is just going to give me the syntax. This is semicolon. Remove that. This is just going to give me the index zero, one, and two. How can we extract the h e y? Would be if I do um, greeting. And then pass this in within the bracket notation. 
And now we get H-E-Y. You can do it this way as well. I'm going to comment this one out, comment this one back in. Cool. Uh, we could also uh, split them at the uh, space. Uh, I'm going to bring it down here at an empty space, and that is like this. They're going to have, uh, like, and, and you're going to end up with this word at an empty space. And uh, the way that you can reverse a string is a little bit tricky in JavaScript, but it is doable. And I'm going to copy this below. Let's say, way, yay, you want to do that, for example. And we're going to say, okay, I want to split it at the empty string, and then I'm going to reverse it. This is another function. Then I'm going to join it back at the empty string. And now you get this. Very cool, right? So that's everything that I wanted to talk about uh, when it came to strings and string methods. Just to strengthen your idea, your uh, knowledge of strings. Next up, we have two more lessons, three more lessons, in fact. The, this one is going to be array methods uh, 27. Cool. So in array methods, uh, there is like a ton of array methods. I'm just going to go over the most used ones. Uh, again, I'm going to have a test array that I've created. This is the test array. I've tried to grab uh, and include all kind of like uh, data types, most of them. The first one that I'm going to talk about is going to be how you can extract elements based on their indexes. Uh, so what I could do is dot items, uh, sorry, console.log. If I just do items, this is going to give me all the array items. Uh, let's say I want to grab the item at the index of zero. It's just going to give me one. At the index of six, it's going to give me a null. Yeah, there is null at the index of six. Now, keep in mind, the index system, the index counting system is different uh, for arrays than strings. So for string, every letter is one index. But in arrays, every item is one index. What does that mean? So the first item in an array is has an index of zero. The entire second item, even though that item is a string that has 100 characters in it, that entire thing is, is uh, like taken into consideration as one item, one array item. So this array, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine items. It doesn't have like the, array, the items length like 30 or 40 items. It just has nine items. Keep that in mind. Uh, you can also say, okay, I want to grab the item that has an index of negative 1. And you're going to get undefined. Why? Because negative 1 is only returned when that element cannot be found. Cool. Uh, I could keep it here. Let's say index 5, 116. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. This is how you can get an index. Uh, you can also add to the end of this array. Adding to end, uh, I'm going to do it uh, like this, items dot push. This is going to add to the end of an array. Let's say December. And let's grab this console log, put it right here. And now you can see at the end, there is that December added there. We can also add uh, to the start, but before doing that, let's remove from end. We can remove, this, is, this method is going to remove the last items, and that is pop. Pop is going to remove the last item. And now if I take a look at my array, December is no longer there. Very cool, very, very cool stuff. We can also add to the start and remove from the start. And for those, we have different methods. Add to start. Uh, to be able to add to the start, we use the unshift method. Items dot unshift, unshift. Uh, what do I want to add? I want to say, wow, wow. Okay, just 
copy it put it here there we go at the start we can see that wow i could increase the width of the screen so everything can be visible in one line could do it a little bit further let's do it further very cool uh, we can also remove from start remove from uh from start that is shift so on shift add it shift remove it items dot shift and this is basically going to remove it we don't have to do anything and now when i take a look at it we just have one we don't have wow and this number this is the counter how many items are there cool we can also loop through a race uh we have already done that but i'm going to do it again and i'm going to say four uh let i now i is the loop agent it could be anything it could be whatever it could be z it is the loop agent and it starts as zero and then we are going to say as long as zero is less than what is the array items length so the items i'm going to comment this one out i should probably show you the items the uh, items length this is going to give us the length of the array and what is the length of the array the length of the array def determines how many items are in the array so we have nine items in the array and therefore the loop is going to run nine times all the way to nine times cool and then each time we are going to increment z by one there we go and what do i want to do every time first i want to take a look at that z which is the loop variable and then i want to grab every element strategically it is items and then pass in as the dot notation now instead of passing index of zero one two you pass in z which actually has an index of zero one two three and now you know why we start from zero because when we are looping over arrays arrays have an index of zero start from zero that's why we start from zero and i'm going to pass in z and there we go this is everything that it is going to give us so it's nine zero one one january two thirty three this has an index of three february has an index of four five and it's going to give us give it to us like that cool right uh we could also loop through an array through another method that is actually a new addition to javascript es6 this is gonna make our life a lot easier i'm gonna say items and when i hit and when i dot when i click the dot you can see right here it says for each this method is used to iterate over items okay and let's see what this says this is a function that accepts up to up to three arguments for each calls the cl callback function one time for each element in the array so in here we pass in a function that is going to be called as many times as there are items as the number of items within that array and each time that function is going to run and here is a good example of using uh, a an error function i'm going to say item okay now uh, and then I'm going to pass an i. i is going to be the index of that item. If item is whatever item from that array that we want to grab. And don't forget the syntax. And then open curly braces, hit enter. What do I want to do? I want to do console.log. I want to grab the item. And I'm going to say item is equal to, uh, you know what? We could use our template, uh, our template strings, backticks. I'm going to say item is dollar sign it's going to grab the value from the item and i'm going to say and it's um the item i could i could do it like this the item this item has an index of has an index of you can see it is it's it's making more sense an index of i and when i save it this is what it returns to us uh, we could um, put it inside quotes. I believe we could. Yep. 
and because the reason that we can use two pairs of uh, quotes different uh, because they are different this is back tick and this is a double quote if you want to use single quote you can do that as well so the item one has an index of zero the item January has an index of one and this is how you can make sense of the data uh, next up let's talk about another array and uh, that is going to be an array of objects that I'm just going to copy paste let's uh, you know what let's since we are no longer talking about this guy let's comment everything out from here I'm going to create I'm going to basically copy paste another array here as well I hope you're not getting tired I'm not <laughs> Uh, this is the array that I'm talking about. Uh, it's going to take a little bit long for me to actually create it. And now you can see what this is. Let's decrease the width of this one as well. So what is this array? This array, come on, buddy. This array is online products. This is These are my courses, JavaScript, Python, CSS layouts, masterclass. So far, we I have just these courses. And I am, in fact, currently in the process of creating my view course yay you can check that out on udemy like by the end of september i hope i can get it out there now we're going to talk about the map method for arrays so the map method loops through the array and in each iteration it is going to grab an item based on the callback function criteria it also returns a new array within the item uh, with the item selected during the iterations. What does that mean? Let's dissect it step by step. It loops through an array. We know that. And in each iteration, it's going to grab an item. It's going to grab an item. We know so far so good. Based on the callback function criteria. What is a callback function? When a function is, at, when a function is inserted into another function, it's a callback function. This arrow function, you can see it has been inserted into this for each function. That's why this arrow, this, uh, arrow function is actually a callback function. That is it. When a function is inserted or is, is defined in another function, that's it. That's a callback function. You're going to hear that a lot. That is actually an advanced concept. And when we create a callback function inside of our map method, the map method is going to uh, loop over that array and in each iteration it's going to grab one of the items if that item satisfies our function. So our function is going to have some sort of criteria. It's like a screening process. So I'm going to say const, uh, let me type it correctly, const prices. Let's say we just want to select the prices from this array, right? So I'm going to say prices online products dot map. So, so far so cool. It has to have a callback function and that's what exactly it says right here. Okay. And the callback function is going to be uh, a, an arrow function. The function parameter is going to be item. This is the function syntax. There we go. And let's say we want to grab all the prices from this array. How can you do that? Using console logs, it's very, very difficult, like console log item, then you, you know what? I'm gonna show it to you how map actually simplifies this process. So if I do console.log online products, you can see we have an array of objects. I could do, okay, let give me the, um, the item or the object that has an index of zero, it's going to give me that, and then, and then that's it. What if you want to select the price? Uh, if I do price, and then it's going to give me 179. So all of this, I need, to set, I need to repeat it four times, right? So I'm going to do one, two, and then three. Let's say you have 10,000 products. Are you willing to repeat it 10,000 times? No. You're going to use a map function. The map function does the same thing in just one line of code. <clears throat> Excuse me. It returns what? Item.price. 
And now, now that it has returned it, we need to actually go ahead and select it. Now, there is a cool thing about arrow functions. Now, arrow functions, if we are just returning something from the arrow function, we don't actually need uh, to provide the uh, return keyword or the curly braces. So if, if I'm just returning anything from the function, I could just remove the return keyword, save it, and this is gonna return uh, something from the function. And I can remove the curly braces from here as well. Uh, item, let's just remove that there. Put, it, put everything on one line, you could do it like this. If you're just returning something from an arrow function. And you can see how simple it is. And you can also remove the parentheses from here as well. But if you save it, Prettier is going to add it. You can configure Prettier to not add parentheses there. If there is one uh, function parameter, no parentheses is required. So this, it could be even simplified to this. That's why people love it, because it is so simple. So, so simple. Uh, now, uh, what we could do is, uh, we could take a look at our prices, console.log, prices. Let's save that, there we go. We got an array of our prices. How can we select that array of prices? We can select the name, oops. We can grab the name of the product as well. So for this one, I'm gonna do name. And for the bottom one, I'm going to do prices, names. And this one is going to give me names. And you know how you can iterate through uh, arrays. You know that, right? Okay, and I think that's it. That's, uh, there is, again, there is just a ton of uh, methods that are available on arrays that are available online. You can just check them out in the MDN documentation, but I'm gonna keep it short. Next up, we have object methods. For object, we don't really have too many, even though it is the main thing in JavaScript, the main data type. We don't have too many um, methods for objects. Let's take a look at the object. Now, keep in mind that an object is an unordered collection of data, related data. Because it is unordered, index doesn't have no meaning, no index, because it's not ordered. The reason that arrays and strings, they have indices, is because they are ordered. They have a certain order, but objects, they're not ordered, that's why index doesn't actually work in here. Let me create an object right here. This is our object. We have product, name, complete JavaScript bootcamp, price, promo available. You can check it out. Uh, and if I just take a look at this product, console.log product. You can see we got the object. Now, we can select the uh, any of these properties from this object using the dot notation and we can select it using the bracket notation first let's take a look at the dot notation so i'm going to do product dot name this is going to give me the name of the product i can use it anywhere i want this is going to give me the price of the product but what happens if i do promo promo available. I mean, this is, right? This is correct. We have been doing it. For, oh, come on, buddy. Just going to copy paste it. But it doesn't work. It says unexpected uh, string syntax error. So if there is more than one word, or if the keys of the object properties, they are surrounded with string quotes, you can use the dot notation. In that manner, for that, you need to do the bracket notation. So you're going to provide bracket, you're going to get rid of that dot, and it's going to give you that. True. There we go. So now you know the difference between the dot notation and the bracket notation. Don't get me wrong, bracket notation can do what the dot notation does, but, it, but the dot notation cannot do what the bracket notation does. Uh, name... Um, 
uh, product name. I could have said product name, but I just said name. So you can see it in here, it just th throws an error. It's undefined, even though it is defined. So if I do price, oh, because the reason that it threw that was because I was selecting name as an identifier. I need to select it as a string. And now there we go, it works. You need to keep these little things in mind because it thinks that I'm naming something name, which is an identifier. No, these are strings. These are not identifiers. Uh -huh. and, and now let's see, what if you want to grab, I'm going to comment all these ones out. What if you want to grab all the keys from an object? You can do that as well. I'm going to say, uh, let uh, object keys, I'm going to store it in here. I'm going to grab our product dot. You're going to um, call the keys. Uh, you're not going to call it on this. You're going to grab the object, the main JavaScript object. And it says it right here. Provides functionality common to all JavaScript objects. You're going to grab the main JavaScript object. And on there, you're going to say keys. And from there, you're going to pass in the product. And if you say console.log object keys, save it. All three keys are extracted into an array. You can do the same thing for the values as well. And you can do the same thing for entries as well. Uh, so here we had uh, values. We had keys. Now I've changed it to values. Here are the values. Very cool. And we can also uh, get the entries as well. The, these are all um, available on the main JavaScript object. This is the JavaScript object from which all the other objects in JavaScript get their properties, get their values, get their, not values, get their methods, and they inherit from this object. So you could say this is the core of JavaScript, this object. Let me copy the core, put it down below. And this one is going to be entries, entries. And this has to be lowercase. And if I save it, there we go. So we got an array of arrays like that. This, this could be useful. Uh, we could also iterate over these entries since we have arrays and half arrays. I could, so I could do object entries dot for each. For each is simpler, right? And I'm, I need to pass in that function. And now since this is object entries, this function is going to run on every individual entry. That's why I'm going to give it the parameter of entry. Function parameters are usually singular. And let's say the key is, key would be equal to entry that has an index of zero. Let's take a look at that. So on any entry, what is any entry? Any entry is any of these arrays. So one entry is one array from here. And within this array, if I select the first item, which has an index of zero, that is going to give me the key. And if I select the entry that has the index of one, that is going to give me the value. And I can basically use template strings. I could do... Uh, key, let's pass in key, and let's pass in value. There we go. So, um, let, okay, oh, oops, this is square brackets. This has to be curly braces. Cut it, come on, buddy, put you here. There we go. So name, complete JavaScript bootcamp. I could uh, comment these ones out, except for the entries and comment that one out as well. So name is complete JavaScript bootcamp, price this and promo is this. You can use it in a text file if you want. Uh, with this, this part is, has also come to an end and we are at the last lesson, cool. The last lesson is DOM. I'm going to copy. I don't know why I copy everything. I shouldn't. And DOM sh is short for document object model. So document, document object 
model, which is shortened as DOM, which is basically HTML. So if you want to have like a shorter and sweeter way of understanding DOM, is just go ahead, open up Chrome. On the left side, go to Inspect, go to Elements. On the left side, you're going to see DOM. Everything that you see on this side, if I zoom in, this is all DOM. This is DOM. Document object model. It is the representation of HTML in the world of JavaScript. That is DOM. It's not like something very, very uh, complicated out of, out of this world. No, it is not. It's very simple. I'm going to get back to console, decrease this window because we're going to need a lot of real estate. Now in DOM, uh, DOM is actually a very, very broad topic. It could get very, very uh, complicated quite quickly. But what I'm going to do is, uh, I could just do the strict equality operator. So DOM, the value and the type is HTML. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to keep it uh, to basics, just the basics. Okay. Now, again, DOM is the representation of HTML in JavaScript. We can also access it uh, by... Uh, doing this console.log if you just pass in document you're gonna see if I just click on it there we go what is it it is that HTML document so you can access it here as well you can take a look at its properties uh, as well but I'm not gonna if I just hit the dot you can see all of these a lot of them hundreds of them they are all of them are available on the document object model there is a ton of things that you can do uh, on this document. The thing that we're mostly interested in is this query selector. We can select any HTML element from the DOM and put it in JavaScript. For example, uh, so I don't know, uh, we don't have anything in the HTML. And for that, I'm just going to create an H1 element. An H1 element, I'm going to give it a nothing, nothing, just an H1 element. It's going to be animal planet. Uh, let's do a paragraph that is going to have a class of description, lorem. And then I'm going to have an anchor element that is not going to go anywhere. That is going to say uh, read more. And I'm going to give it an ID as well, link. Cool. So this is simple stuff. We know all of this. You know all of this. And I'm going to come here. Let's say I want to select, I'm going to bring it down. I want to select this title and I want to put it in the JavaScript, in the console. And I need to tell you this, that this is where we actually try to get out of the console and into the actual web page. But everything that I'm going to do here, it's going to be within the console. But, the, but that's actually something that we have to do in the web page when we get to our projects. After this, we are going to have uh, our three components or projects, and all three of them are actually completed in the browser, not in the console. This is the last lecture where we're going to uh, actually have the entire lecture inside the console. Console is still very relevant, very useful to debug your code. It's very, very very useful and uh, in real world when you create real world applications uh, there is going to be a, a lot of consoles that you're going to use cool so when you say query selector it selects an html element and then you're going to open up a either a pair of single quotes or double quotes and i'm going to zoom in so you can see this single quotes since you have knowledge of css within the single quotes we select an HTML element with the knowledge of CSS. So any valid CSS selector could be written here. I could do an H1. This is going to give me H1. I could do the ID of link. Again, within the quotes, just within the quotes, this is how HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are connected to one another. Within the quotes, you can do an ID selector, a class selector, attribute selector, combinator selector, grouping selector, simple element selector, universal selector, whatever. You can do that. And you can take a look at it there. What is the name? Uh, links. No, link. Save that. There we go. Here is the link. So anything that 
any selector in CSS, you can use it right here. But this is not how we are going to work. We are going to select an HTML element and store it in a variable so we can use it later. The first method that I'm going to take a look at will be, uh, this is going to be element selector. It's the same thing that I just did, but I'm going to document it so you have this frame of reference. Let's say we want to select the title. Keep in mind, I'm using const because I don't want to change this title to something else down the line. Document, on the document, we are going to say query selector and open up uh, quotes. And then I'm going to select it using the HTML name. Save that. And if I say console.log, I can take a look at the title. There we go. The title is right there. And if you want to just grab the animal planet from there, just the inner text, you can do that as well. And that is going to be inner, inner text. There we go. Animal planet. Simple stuff, right? This is, this is something called the element selector. Next up, let's talk about how we can select an HTML element using its class. It's basically the same thing. No, it's not. So const, uh, we have the description description, correct? And I'm going to say, again, everything is on document because it's the document object model. It's the object that is representing HTML to JavaScript. This Everything is on this document. Keep that in mind. Query selector. Now, there are other methods of selecting like uh, get element by ID, get, get element by class. No. Get element by tag name. No. I'm not going to do any of those like this like get element by ID, by class name, by name, by tag name, by root notes, get selection. No, we are just going to do query selector because query selector is CSS and CSS is something that you know and you need to keep it simple. And I'm going to use the class name. So if, if I were to select this and style it in CSS, how would I do? I would select the class name. And then I would, because it's a class name, I would put a dot there. And let's take a look at it. Descri oops. Console.log description dot, uh, just description. And it's going to give us that paragraph. We can take a look at the class name as well. If I just do class list, this is going to list all the classes. Since there is just one, it's just going to give us one. And it's going to return a DOM token list. Length is 1. The index is 0. And you can see this, even though it says DOM token list, it is actually an array. You can grab it. You can iterate through it using a for loop or a for each method. Okay, I'm not going to comment that one out. And the next one is using the ID selector. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Uh, const, const link. I'm going to say again document dot query selector, query selector, and pass in the ID. And what is the ID value? Link console dot log. And let's pass in link. And we can extract the ID from there as well by just doing dot ID. There we go. The ID is link. So now that you know how you can select HTML elements, I'm going to give you this cool comment as a reward. It's, uh, it doesn't look cool, but if you increase the width of this window to here, now it looks cool, right? Uh, this cool comment, I'm going to give it to you. And I'm going to give you one more cool comment, which is uh, this one. Let me just copy it, put it right here. There we go. Now we talked we, we talked about uh, selecting HTML elements. Now let's interact with HTML elements. Comment everything out. How can we interact with it? And I'm going to give you just one example. Let's say uh, I'm going to keep this link since we are going to use it. Now I have selected link, right? I'm going to grab the link. And on the link, I'm going to add an event. What is an event? Anything that, they br that the user is doing on any particular web page as an event. 
So if the user is scrolling, that is an event. If the user is clicking on the page, when we are talking about the JavaScript of the uh, JavaScript side of the website, it, that's an event. When the when the user is even hovering the mouse, like going from one word, uh, one part of the website to the next part, that is an event. Hitting keyboard, an event. I don't know, like refreshing an event. Everything is an event. Uh, everything uh, that the user does on a web page or the user interactions are called DOM events. Document object model events. In JavaScript, they're called events. And technically and simply, they are called interactions. Any kind of interaction that you have with any kind of website, that could be an event. That is actually an event. And that event can be caught or technically can be listened to with JavaScript. And based on that event, you can do something. Okay, so I'm gonna grab this link, which is this read more button. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab the click event on this button. How can I do that? First, you need to add that event. Then you need to specify what type is the event. So here is the type of the event. And after you have specified the type, you need to specify the listener, which is a callback function. So what is the type of the event? The type of the event is click, comma. This is another great way, great place to use uh, arrow functions. You could use arrow functions or you could use function expressions. Anyway, I'm just gonna use arrow functions. And I'm gonna pass in, uh, as a parameter, this event object. I'm gonna pass in the, we are gonna take a look at this event object, don't worry about it. So we have selected the event object. First, let's take a look at it. What is this event object that I'm talking about too much? Now, I've saved it, it's not showing it to me, why? Because it is, it is listening for an event. And what is the type of that event? That type of that event is click. And on which element should the click happen on the link. So if I click the title, nothing works. Click the paragraph, nothing works. But as soon as I click this read more button, you can see this is the event. And let's take a look at it. Uh, when you're creating projects, most of your time will be spent in this, in this, in this DOM. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. So you can see this is called a pointer event. There is a lot of information. Uh, we can see that client X, client Y, where that event actually occurred on the page. Uh, let's see. Th this is the offset from the page. Um, okay, this is the path, uh, which is going to give us the, uh, from where the event, where that, um, where the event happened. Where is the path for that HTML element? So that HTML element is within the window object. From there, within, within, it is within the document. The document has an HTML element. The HTML element has a body, and then the body has an element called A with an ID of link. It, it basically gives us this entire map, but in reverse, right? So in here, we start from top to bottom, but in here, we start from bottom to top. So in the elements, we can see we have the HTML. This entire thing is the document. Then we have the HTML. Then we have the body. Then we have that element. It's just in reverse. So it's everything you need to know about that event, about that element, and how you can interact with that element. It gives you everything you need to know. So now, what do I want to do here? Let's take a look at the event target. Okay, let's put a right... Here, let's see what the target is going to give us. Dot target. And when I save it, when nothing happens. Again, I need to click. So when I click, this function is listening for that click. When it receives the click, it's going to run this function, this callback function. Cool. What function is listening for the click? It is this add event listener function. So if I click on it, there we go. So this is the target. This is what we have clicked on. And we can grab the target text content, text content, save that. There we go. This is how you can dissect HTML elements in JavaScript. And let's say when the user clicks on this, uh, you want to change the text content to something else. 
So I'm going to say event dot target. You can see how I found it out. Uh, I found that text content. I want to change it to reassign it to redirect. And then let's say console dot log event dot target dot text content. Save that. So as soon as the user clicks on it, it's going to change to redirect. And you can see it said read more and now it says redirect. So this is how you manipulate HTML elements. I'm going to reload the page. It says read more. Everything is okay. It's a sunny day. And when the user clicks on it, it's the text content is changed based on JavaScript. That is very cool. You can actually change the content dynamically. And this is where modern web is born. This is where modern web is born because you can change the value, the content of the web page dynamically based on some interaction. This is how, this is why React, Vue, Angular, Svelte, all of these, they were born. So they can change the value dynamically. And this is where the power of JavaScript is actually at work. This is where it, it starts, to, uh, uh, it, is, it starts uh, to get very, very, very powerful when we talk about JavaScript. So JavaScript is very powerful, and this is its power, like a small representation of its power, like a very, very tiny minuscule. It was very simple. Uh, next up, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about our projects. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the projects from a blank screen. Uh, and for the projects, we are going to have different folders uh, for project one, for project two, and for project number three. So let's go ahead and let's create the very first folder for the very first project of this crash course. I'm going to, the name of the folder will be project dash one. And in here, I'm going to create three files. The first file will be the index.html file. The second one will be style.css. And the third one, app.js. Now, I'm not going to jump into too much detail when it comes to HTML and CSS, but I will be typing them out. So I will be giving you some explanation, but not a whole lot of them. For the uh, first project, the first project is going to be the off canvas responsive menu. And I'm going to show that to you right now. So we know what exactly it is that we are trying to build. I'm just going to wait for it. There we go. So first, let's create the UI of the project. I'm going to generate a, a, an empty boilerplate. And in here, this is the name of the project of Canvas Responsive Menu, Responsive Menu. And in here, I'm going to have one uh, element that is going to hold all the links, and that is going to be a nav element, a, a semantic element. I'm going to give it a class of navigation. And within here, uh, we are going to have six links. So I'm going to have six anchor elements. And for all of them, I would like to provide the href as the hash sign. There we go. Let's save that. Uh, okay, it didn't add it, it's ref, it's added there, there was a mistype, and I think that's it, yep, let's save that. So for the first link, I'm going to say home. For the second link, because all of them are inline, that's why they're represented like this. You can just hit enter like a few times if you want, or you could just keep them as they are. There we go, if you save it, it's just, just going to go back about then we are going to have services after that solutions solutions and the next one is right here pricing doesn't matter because it's just going to be the main focus is uh, on the actual um, functionality of this there we go i can right click and open it up with live server there we go this is what we have done so far and after that, I'm going to create uh, elements for our hamburger. Uh, I'm going to have a div with a class of hamburger. And within that div, I'm going to create three more divs. And each of them is going to have a class of line uh, hyphen dollar sign, which is going to be line one, line two, line three. You can see that in the pop-up as well. 
that's it. There is not going to be anything. Uh, let's link our uh, app.js file. It's going to be source of uh, app.js file. Let's save that. Let's link our style as well. We are done with the HTML. Let's jump into CSS. In CSS, I'm just going to go, I'm just going to quickly cover the styles. I'm going to add a general selector. And I'm going to grab all the margin for all the HTML elements, make them zero, all the padding, make a zero, and box sizing is going to be border box. So in the size of any CSS box, the border and the padding will be included in the final calculation. Uh, this is a habit uh, specifying the font size for HTML as 62.5% uh, or 10 pixels. It just makes the calculation of rem unit a lot easier. I, I like to work with rem, and rem is one rem is 16 pixels of the font size of the HTML, a root element. But when I decrease it to 10 pixels or 62.5%, then one rem will become 10 pixels as opposed to being originally 16. And 10 pixels is easier. Like two rem, I know it's going to be 22, sorry, 20 pixels. And if it was um, 16 pixels, then 2 rem would be 32 pixels. And 2.5 rem would be a little bit difficult to calculate, but it's just a habit. It's not a good or bad practice. It's just a preference, just something that I do. Font family will be uh, Arial Helvetica. Uh, and I'm going to give this page a height of 100 VH. This is a highly bad practice to provide specific height on the body, but for this specific example, because I want the background to stretch uh, to the to grab the entire viewport, I'm just going to do 100 VH, and then there is going to be this background color uh, 554994. There we go, and that's it. Let's take a look at our changes. There we go. This is what I've done. I'm going to move forward. Uh, I'm going to grab the anchor elements, text decoration, that underline. I'm going to get rid of it. Font size, 2 rem, 20 pixels. Color will be white. And after that, let's move on. Let's grab the navigation. Now, um, I'm going to use uh, modern CSS techniques to align our elements meaning I'm either going to use CSS Flexbox or I'm going to use CSS Grid. Uh, I've never taught anyone uh, how to use floats, um, uh, and I'm not going to teach you that because they are that's a, a completely outdated technique. We are going to work with HTML5 and CSS3, latest of the latest. That's why we are going to just cover the latest techniques, the best and the the techniques that are going to get you a job. Cool. Uh, that's why for this navigation, I'm not using a div. I'm actually using the HTML5 semantic element that has to represent a navigation. And this is the nav. That's why uh, in my code, if you have taken any of my uh, job, uh, Udemy courses, CSS, you will know this, that I try to st uh, stay away from divs. I can't. It, it's not possible to stay away from them completely, but I try to stay away from them as much as possible. I don't like Dividus code. Let's do a background color. This is going to be, uh, that's three, four, five, six, and seven, nine. Cool. I'm going to do display flex, uh, all the direct elements that are going to become flex items, and then they're going to go horizontal. They were horizontal, but it's just a little bit more control over those elements. Justify content is going to center them horizontally in the center. Gap is exactly what it says. Gap provides some gap between the elements or among the elements. Cool. And let me increase uh, its, oh, its font smooth. It has to be font size. I was wondering why the font size is small. There we go. So you can see already it's looking like the, our final design. Now, so far in the desktop view, this is fine. There, is, there are no problems. But as soon as I switch to responsive tab, let me just increase the width. And you can see at around 700, 
there isn't enough space on the left and on the right of this navigation. And you can see that we, we get overflow. This is how overflow is shown in Chrome, but in Firefox, actually, there's gonna be a horizontal scroll bar. And what I'm gonna do is around 700, I'm gonna add a media query. So uh, again, if you're not comfortable with HTML and CSS, you should be before jumping into any JavaScript course. So I'm gonna apply this at a max width of 700, which means these styles will only be applied at a maximum width of 700, since that is the maximum width, it's just, it can only go below 700. Cool. So when you say max width 700, the actual range will be from zero pixels all the way to the maximum, which is 700. These styles will not be applied on 710 or 800 or 900. First off, I'm gonna grab the navigation. Uh, navigation and on the navigation uh, when when I'm in the 700 I'm going to change the flex direction to column when I'm below 700 this is what I'm going to end up with uh, so what we would want it what we are trying to do is to get uh, to end up with this okay and I'm going to give it a little bit more padding 7 rem uh, the height Height will be 100%. Transform. Originally, I'm going to transform it, but when I click on that button, that hamburger menu, it's going to transform back in. That's going to be translate x negative 100 rem, which is going to be 1000, and it is going to rotate as well to negative 0.5 turn. Turn is a CSS unit. It's one turn is 360 degrees. 0 0.5 is 180 in case you haven't seen it before. Position is gonna be fixed. Uh, the reason for this is, so it doesn't matter how much the user scrolls, the uh, navigation will always appear. It's always gonna be there. It's not gonna go away with the scroll. And then I'm gonna say, okay, start from top zero and left zero. Transition, transition all 0 0.6 seconds. And ease and out. Ease and out. This is going to be the transition timing function. Let's grab our. Uh, if I take a look at this, we shouldn't see that because it's off canvas. And let's style the hamburger menu so we can see our Ike, our links. So for the hamburger, uh, first off, I'm going to provide a background color of white so you can see where that is. Let's add a height of five rem, a width of. Uh, width of 5 rem, let's save that. And after that, let's do a position fixed. Uh, it's gonna start from top 2 rem from the top and from the right by 2 rem as well. Again, display flex, uh, flex direction. I want all three lines to be vertically aligned, that's why I'm gonna do flex direction column. Align items is going to be centered. Now this is going to, since the flex direction is column, align items works horizontally. And justify content, uh, it works vertically. And gap is going to be one rem. There aren't going to be any lines, but we will be able to see this hamburger menu. Now let's code up the lines. There are some styles which are going to be shared among all three lines, like line one, line two, and line three. This is line two, and this is line three. Height for all three lines will be two pixels. Uh, width is gonna be 100% of their container, which is that hamburger menu. The background color will be white. Now I'm gonna comment out that. And the transition for the lines is gonna be all 0 0.25 seconds. Ease and out. Cool. Let's take a look at our lines. Oh, whoops. There has to be an E there as well. It's not line, it's len. Cool. There we go. These are the lines. We don't have the functionality yet. We are going to get to that. Don't worry. That is the JS part. I just want to be thorough. And this is a good practice for your HTML and CSS anyway. You can't get away from HTML and CSS if you want to become 
a fantastic web developer. It doesn't matter if you're just doing it as a hobby, like creating websites with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, or if you want to work anywhere, or if you want to do freelance. It doesn't matter what it doesn't even matter what framework you're working with, whether that is Vue, React, or Angular, or whatever. They're all going to use HTML and CSS in some way or another. And you need to be familiar with that. You need to be a master. In fact, you need to be a master of it. Then it's going to be a lot easier for you to focus on those technologies. For example, if you want to learn React, it would be better if you master HTML, CSS, and JavaScript so you can just focus on the React parts of JavaScript. You don't have to worry, okay, okay, what, what is a loop and what does a loop do? You don't have to worry, but you should not worry about that when you're learning React. You should only worry if you can create a component with React. Now, these uh, classes, these three classes that I'm about to write here, these are dynamic classes, which means they will be toggled using JavaScript. So when I toggle this class, when I toggle the first line, I want it to rotate because I want to form that cross. And now these values that I'm about to provide here, these are extremely, extremely experimental. I've experimented with them like maybe like five to 10 minutes to just get them to, get them to align correctly. Uh, you can just change their values to see how they can actually, uh, the, how, how these values are achieved. There isn't a formula, it's just, it just trial, uh, trial and error. 0.6 rem. It does help if you know when when I say 0.6 rem, I'm moving from left of the screen to the right of the screen. Just the mo direction of the movement. If you know that, then it's going to be easier. But still, it sometimes is just a hassle, and you have to do it like for like one hour to get it right. 70%. There we go. You can use this in any project that you want, and I've already coded that coded these projects um, standalone so you can you integrate them into your own projects. For line two, line one is going to be one side of the cross, line three is going to be the other, but line two will be visibility hidden. And let's put that here. This is going to be line three. There we go. So for this one, um, let me copy these. Width is going to be 70%. The rotation is going to be negative 45 degrees. This is going to be 1 rem. And this will be minus 1 rem. Let's save everything. And nothing is going to change because we have not actually gotten into JavaScript. There we go. This is our main lesson. Now, uh, this is the first project, so I'm going to explain it a little bit more than the uh, upcoming two projects. Now, whenever you're working with JavaScript uh, in the front end, uh, you're working with some kind of HTML element. So if I take away all the HTML elements, JavaScript actually can't work in the browser unless there is some kind of, some sort of markup for it. So it can be applied on those, on that markup. So there has to be some sort of an element to receive some kind of functionality. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to explain it in this manner so you can really relate to JavaScript and why JavaScript is necessary. So here we have an, an issue. And above 700, I can see my navigation very well. But below 700, it's not there. And I need to click this so the navigation can appear. Now, this is an issue that JavaScript aims to solve. Now, you need to take a look at what are the elements that play the major role in this scenario. What are the main elements? The first main element is going to be this hamburger menu because when I click it, then I want to see the navigation um, pop back in. Cool. So that's one thing that I need to keep in mind. That is the first element that plays a role in this functionality. What is the second element? The second element is the navigation itself because that has to come out of the canvas. It's off canvas. It has to become on canvas. So far, so cool. Now, what else? Now, when I click on this hamburger menu, I'm, I want to form a cross. So, what is, what are the elements that actually form that cross? It's the hamburger first line and the hamburger second line. 
So, so far I know I need to select, I need to work with four HTML elements. I'm going to repeat this, hamburger, navigation, the first line and the third line. But what about the second line? Do I need to work on it using JavaScript? Do I, do I need to add a, some sort of minuscule functionality by JavaScript? Yes, because when I click it, that second line, it disappears. So, so far, as a result, we just have five elements. I want to have the navigation, the in order, the hamburger, the navigation, and all three lines. And this is how you know when a project requires JavaScript or not depending on what it is that you want to do. So it, this formula only works for this specific scenario. You want to apply a specific functionality to any specific element. You need to select it in JavaScript and store it in a variable. That's the, like, the shortcut. Now, there are other elements here as well, like these anchor elements, like the body element. But because no functionality I need to apply on these, I'm not going to select them in JavaScript. Only select the elements that you want to provide functionality. So let's select them in order. The first one was the hamburger menu, and I'm going to store that in this variable. And we know how we can do that. We are going to jump into document. Document is DOM. DOM is that HTML. So everything you can see in this page, this is DOM. Uh, when you right click, you come in here, everything you see on this left side, that is DOM. That is DOM, it, HTML is called DOM when it comes into the world of JavaScript. Document object model. So it, it is that document. Cool. And when if you want to select any HTML elements, where are they present? They're present in the document. That's why I need to select document and from document, since document is an object, hence the name document object model, how can I select a property from this object? I can select it using the dot notation. So I'm going to hit dot. And now what do I want, what do I want to do? I want to select an HTML element. There are a lot of ways, but we have studied only query selector and I'm just going to suffice to that. So query selector, and I'm going to open and I'm going to create quotes. Within these quotes, any valid CSS selector works. Now, I want to grab the hamburger, and I have the class for it. I'm going to put in the class name. Is this a valid selector in CSS? No, because if you want to select a class, you need to add the dot as well. That's what we've done exactly in here. There we go. Exactly like this. So you can just copy it from here, put it in the query selector. That's why I emphasize I emphasize on query selector. This was the first element. The second element is the nav document dot. Again, the same thing, the same process. And then we are going to select navigation using its class name. You can select elements using element names as well. But because that is a bad practice in CSS, that's also a bad practice in JavaScript. So it's the same rule because we are doing the same CSS selector. Now after this, I want to select all three lines, hamburger first line, second line, and third line. Let's select all of them. Uh, and it's a good practice when you're selecting these uh, to use the constant variable so we don't end up changing them in the future. It's a better practice. I'm going to do const um, burger first. You can come up with another name. I'm just going to call it burger first line. That is going to be document query selector. And from there, what is going to be the class name? If I want to select it using the class name, it is line hyphen one. And I'm going to copy it two more times. This is going to be line two and this is going to be line three. And I can see an error, uh, a typo. So this is burger. This one is second line. And the third one is the third line. There we go. So everything we wanted to work with in, the, in, in, in JavaScript, I've selected that within the JavaScript. Now, let's think of how we can apply this functionality. I told you that I'm going to be explaining this first project a little bit more. So this is going to lay the foundation for the upcoming two projects. And I'm not going to explain them in this depth. So you need to pay very, very close attention to this project. Now, what it is that we want to do, now I know, 
I, I know exactly what elements I need to apply JavaScript on. But what is that JavaScript that I need to apply? It's very simple. When I click on this hamburger menu, keep in mind, I'm not clicking on any singular hamburger lines, but I'm clicking on this hamburger menu. When I click on it, what do I want to do? I want to bring back that navigation. So I want it, I want to bring it back in. When I click on this hamburger menu, and there is something that I've forgotten to add in here. After the navigation, there is this dis display nav class. And when I'm, I'm gonna re-explain this. So when, when I click on the hamburger menu, I'm gonna bring this back. That's gonna be translate x zero, and it's gonna be rotate zero. There we go. So again, when I click on this hamburger menu, I want the navigation to come back. Where is the navigation? It's 100 rem to the left of the page, and it's already 180 degrees upside down. But I don't want it to be like that. I want to bring it back, and I want it, I want it to receive these two styles. Now, in the JavaScript world, what we are trying to do is we are trying to add a class to that element dynamically using javascript so i'm going to grab the hamburger menu since the uh since the clicking is going to happen on this hamburger menu keep in mind not the first line not the second line not the third line i'm going to click the hamburger menu how can i click it i need to add an event to it we have talked about this that's going to be all the events in in the world of browser everything all of them could be caught using this function this add event listener out of a listener first requires you to specify the type of event. I want to click. So the type of event is the click event. And after you've specified that, you need to pass in a callback function. What does that mean? It means when you grab the click event, when you receive it, or when you're listening for it, and when you caught it, what do you want to do? And whatever you want to do, that, that is going to be done using this function. First thing that I would like to do is I would like to grab, uh, uh, we have already talked about the event object itself, right? In our previous concept. So I'm not gonna go over it again. I'm just gonna do a, an arrow function. Now, first things first, when I click on the hamburger menu, I wanna grab the nav uh, uh, element and I, I wanna add a class to it. So how can I add a class? First, I need to tap into its class list. From there, I'm gonna add a class. Now, when I click on the hamburger menu, I wanna add the class of display nav, right? From CSS. We could do that very easily. But when I click again, I wanna remove that class. So is it good if I add the class and then the remo remove it using two lines or just use the toggle function of JavaScript, toggle method. This, this, what does this mean? It means that when, if that class name has been added, remove it, or if it is removed, then add it. It's gonna decide it automatically and intelligently for us. Now, in here, I'm, I need to only pass in the class name. Keep in mind, within the toggle function, it's not the realm of CSS selectors. But here, since I've already tapped into the world of class list for this navigation, I only need to pass in the class name. I'm not selecting the class, I'm referencing the class. Keep that in mind. That's why there is no dot here, because this is a class name. It requires a class name. Why is there a dot here? Because this is a CSS selector. These two are different. Here, I'm selecting an element. Here, I'm just adding a class to an already selected element. Let's save it, let's take a look at it, and there we go. So now I can show that to you. I'm gonna zoom in. So you can see this navigation, it just has one class, correct? When I click on it, you can see it's, it has another class dynamically added to it using JavaScript. And now that it has this class, since toggle is, uh, is intelligent, when I click on this again, toggle knows that since the element has the class, it's gonna remove it. There we go. And now the element doesn't have the class, it's gonna add it. 
So that's why we use toggle. There we go. So now that this part is done, what is the other part? The other part is to form a cross. Keep in mind, we have three toggle classes in CSS, line toggle one, two, and three. I want to add the line one toggle dynamically to line one, line two toggled to line two, and line three to line three. I want to add it dynamically, but when do I want to add it? When I click on the hamburger menu. So I don't have to, I don't really need to get out of this event listener. Within here, I'm just going to add those. So let's select the burger first line. Then we are going to tap into its class list. And from there, we are going to toggle which class? Line hyphen, line hyphen one hyphen toggled. Keep in mind, this is not a CSS selector. And since we have already said that we are talking about classes, we don't need to add that dot. This is for line one, and these two are for line two and three. This is line two and line three. For the line two, we have the second line, burger second line, and then we have burger third line. And that's it. This project is done. It's This is how simple JavaScript is. Click on it, it forms a cross, the navigation comes back, click on it again, it deforms the cross, and the navigation goes away as well. Now this is how we are actually working with HTML and CSS and JavaScript, and this is how simple it could get. And it's very simple, keep, uh, keep that in mind. You just have to, the important part and the critical part is you need to understand what it is that, that you're trying to do. If you diagnose that in, uh, well, and you know exactly what it is that you're trying to do, then you can, based on that, you can select the relevant HTML elements, select the relevant CSS classes, and apply the relevant functionality. It's that simple. Now, the first project is done, and I am going to go ahead and I'm gonna open up the files for the second project in the other screen that I have, and I'm gonna right click, go to here. And I've opened it up right here. Now, here is the second project and what it is that I'm going to try to do here. Uh, when I click on this top part, this header part, I want this information to be shown. In other words, I'm increasing the height so the info can be shown. And when I unclick the information, when I click again, the information will be gone. And for this one, I'm going to create another folder. And I'm sure you understood that. Now, keep in mind, I'm not going to be explaining this in that depth. I'm just going to go over it, all right? Because now you know how the functionality works. You just need more and more practice. And that's exactly what I'm trying to give you, practice. This is project number two. Uh, for project number two, we have an index.html. Make sure to click on the actual folder for the project to create files. Then we have style.css, app.js. Let's close this. Let's jump into the HTML, create the boilerplate. I'm going to link the style, uh, the HTML. Style.css. Let's link the script source app.js. There we go. Now, first off, I'm going to jump into the HTML. Now, before jumping there, creating the HTML, I'm going to include this font awesome link. This font awesome link is free. You can use it in any project you want. And in case you don't know what that is, font awesome basically gives us uh, these cool icons like this plus, this uh, negative sign. And these icons, they are basically fonts. So all the font uh, properties or and text properties that you can apply on regular text, you can apply on these fonts as well. They're extremely lightweight, they're fast, and they're free as well. There is a paid plan, but I don't recommend that. That's very, uh, that's not going to be, you're not going to need that that much often. Okay, so what do we want to create here? I'm going to have three sections. And within these sections, what I will be having is 
every individual content that we're going to end up with. Okay, first let's diagnose the HTML. Now, before uh, recreating anything with HTML and CSS, you need to understand what are going to be your, at least partially, what are going to be your um, parent uh, containers and contained elements. Now, what I'm going to have is, clearly this top part is different than the bottom part. So I'm going to have some sort of a header for my content and some sort of the content for my content. So for every individual uh, accordion, drop down accordion, I'm gonna have accordion component, I'm gonna have one, ele one element for the header, the other element for the content. And then I'm gonna have one for this, the same structure for the first one, and then for CSS, and then for JS. And all three of them will be wrapped inside one other element, one giant element. Let's come here, and I, I am used to using the main element. I'm gonna give it a class of container. This is gonna be the container for all three uh, of the accordion items. And uh, I'm gonna be specifying them using the section element. This is also a semantic element. And I'm gonna give it a class of accordion. This is gonna be the shared class and then there is going to be a custom attribute, a data attribute. Now, a data attribute is sort of a custom attribute that is used a lot with JavaScript. The data hyphen part is something that you need to provide, but the other part, you can write anything that you want. So you can say data theme, you can say data index, you can, you can do whatever you want. In here, I'm going to do data theme. So the theme of the first section is HTML. The theme of the second section is CSS. I'm just copy pasting it. And the theme of the third section is JavaScript. So far, so cool, right? Now, for in the first section, we have the first, comp the first item of the accordion. And remember, we had two elements. So I'm gonna create a div. The first part was the header, and the second part was the content. Remember? There we go. Within the header, what it is that I'm gonna have? Within the header, I'm gonna have an H2 element that is gonna contain everything else. So I'm gonna create an H2 element. Within the H2 element, I'm gonna create a button element. Within the button element, I'm gonna create a span element that is gonna have a class of header underscore underscore title. And the span is gonna say HTML. And then I'm gonna create another diff that is gonna have the class of header underscore underscore indicator indicator and within this indicator what do we need we need that plus sign and we need the negative sign uh, if you if this is the first time you're working with um, font awesome icons they are created using the i element and this i element needs to have classes that resemble classes from font awesome then you can grab it from their cdn and put it in your project these class names, if a solid is something that is provided by Font Awesome. If a solid means this icon is a solid icon, and then what type of icon it is? It is the FA plus, FA Font Awesome. And then, since we already know that if we want to provide more than one class to an HTML element, we need to separate them using spaces. These two classes, they're provided by Font Awesome. But this class, this plus class, is the class that I'm providing to select it in our CSS and style it. The same thing for the other one. I'm going to say minus, and this one is going to say minus as well. Let's save that. Open our changes, and there we go. This is what we have done. You can see uh, all of them are within this button. We are actually selecting and styling the button. Where is the, okay, here is the minus sign. Very cool. Uh, there we go. Even though it says English, it's thinking that it is Arabic. Now that the header part is done, I'm going to collapse it, and I'm going to provide a space there. Let's jump into the content. What do we have within the content? Within the content, first I'm going to create a div, and within the div, I'm going to create a paragraph element, 
and within the paragraph element, I'm just going to copy paste this text that I got from Encyclo from Wikipedia. And this is just so I don't have to provide any kind of dummy text. Cool. Let's save that. There we go. This is everything we have. Now I'm going to repeat this process two more times. That's why I'm just going to copy these, put them within this section. There we go. And for the next section, uh, instead of HTML, I'm going to say CSS. We are going to have plus and minus. And for the content, this is the content. Let's add it. Final section is JavaScript. Okay, let me collapse these two, copy them, and put them right here. So for the JavaScript, instead of CSS, I'm going to do JavaScript. And here is going to be the content for that. There we go. So, so far, so cool. We have all of our content. Everything is done. I'm going to jump into CSS. Uh, these things I've already done, so I'm not going to repeat myself. Just some uh, general styling on our elements. I'm doing font size 10 pixels. Let's grab the container. On the container, I'm going to do a margin of top and bottom 2 rem. And left and right, I'm going to do auto. Now, this technique is actually a hack to center any element horizontally, but you need to specify some kind of width as well. That's why I'm going to say 50%. For the elements within this container, I'm going to do display flex, but flex is going to put all three of them side by side, but I want them to be like one on top of the other. So I'm going to change the flex direction to call. Align items is going to be center as well. After that, let's grab each individual, uh, all the accordions together. Since this is a shared class, for the accordions, I'm going to do a background color of white and a display of flex and a flex direction of column. I don't think I need this background, so let's save that. There we go. This is what we have ended up with. Accordion. Yep, let's move on. Now I'm going to select these elements, these section elements using their data uh, property. We can select them using this data property. This is selecting elements using um, HTML attributes. So the element that has a data theme of HTML, I want to I want it to have a border uh, border top left radius of one rem and a border top right radius of one rem. And then a background color of, uh, it's gonna be A66CFF. And then I'm just gonna copy paste this down below. Next up, let's grab the CSS. For this one, I'm not gonna have any border, but the background color is gonna be EE D180. Save that. Let's do it for the JavaScript as well. JavaScript. This is going to be border bottom. There we go. And the color for it is going to be B27. B27082. Uh, there we go. And we can see the colors that have been applied. Uh, I'm going to grab the header class. For the header class, I'm just going to add a padding of 2 rem, which is 20 pixels in this scenario. I'm going to grab the header button. I'm going to say, okay, width for you is going to be 100% uh, display flex, uh, justify content, space between. Align items is going to be center. I don't know why I feel so sleepy. <laughs> uh, I'm going to remove the background. None. Uh, this is not a good thing. Uh, the outline is going to be none. Come on, buddy. Outline none. 
and then the border is going to be none as well and finally font size for this one is going to be 2.8 rem and font weight will be bold let's save our changes there we go so this is what we have ended up with we're going to get rid of these don't worry about them and let's just move on i'm going to grab the content let's style our content for content i'm going to do the height zero let's save that and you can see there is no height there that's why the content cannot be shown except for the last one which basically overflows and you might be asking, okay, where is the content going to come from? And the answer is it's going to come from JavaScript. Let's do overflow hidden. So we don't see that weird text. And now when I save it, everything should be clean. There we go. Now when I click, then I should, uh, I, I want to see that content. But we are going to come back to that later, like a couple of minutes. Uh, in the transitioning, I'm going to transition height. So I need to spell it correctly, H-E-I-G-H-T, 0.3 seconds, and ease in out. Cool, so far. Uh, let's grab the content paragraph, font size 1.8 rem, line height 1.52, padding 0 for top, 2 rem for left and right, and 2 rem for bottom now that these are done let's select the plus sign as well as the minus sign what do i want to do for this first off let's say cursor pointer uh, i could do that for the header as well so cursor pointer now it doesn't matter okay it's right here because that is the button so let me bring it to the button there we go. As you can see, it's not cursor pointer aside from this. And now it is cursor pointer. Cool. And then I'm going to add a transition. Uh, it's going to be all 0 0.25 seconds, ease and out. Let's save that. Now, next up, uh, we are going to grab and we are going to uh, display one button and one icon and not display the other one. Within the accordion, I'm going to grab the plus sign and I'm going to say display block. Cool. So I want the plus sign to be shown originally, but when the user clicks on it to expand on the info, I want the plus sign to say display none and then the minus sign to say display block. And um, we are basically going to switch these classes with JavaScript. Accordion minus sign display none. Originally, I don't want to see that minus sign. Keep that in mind. So I'm just seeing only the plus sign. But when I click on it, then I want to see the minus sign. And now we are going to have two dynamic classes. One is going to be dot accordion dot as dot open. And this class is going to be applied on the plus sign. Cool. And uh, on the plus sign, so when the accordion is open, we don't see the plus sign. Therefore, the plus sign is going to be none. And as opposed to this one, the minus sign will be block. Uh, this is going to be uh, minus. Cool. HTML and CSS are done. Let's jump into JavaScript. Now, uh, let's take a look at what it is exactly that we are trying to do here. Uh, so we are trying to, uh, first off, again, you need to specify what it is that you want to do in JavaScript. And then when you know what that is, you need to specify your HTML elements and then the actual functionality which that has to be applied on which element. So I want to select this header. This is the header that I want to select, right? And then I also want to provide functionality on this header. So when I click on this header, I want to add a height to every header that I'm actually clicking. So let's first accomplish that. And that's basically it. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create an element right here. First off, we need to select that accordion container which is this main element since this main element is actually the element 
that is hmm. okay uh, we could go this way but we could also select these as well just the accordion just the header from here like this header class and then accordion.header let's select it using that so what is it that I want to do I'm going to say const uh, const let me spell it correctly uh, within the const first name to provide the uh, variable name now I want to select the header so I'm going to store the header right here the header is uh, available in the document dot query selector and the class is just header now that we have selected the header what it is that we are trying to do here when I click on this header what I want to do is uh, if uh, I click on the header I want to expand the header and show all the info so let's do header dot add event listener cool so far so cool and what is going to be the type of the event again the type of the event is click and then what it is that I want to apply I'm going to grab the event object itself so don't worry about it we are going to grab it and we are going to take a look at it so first off let's console log this event object console log uh, this and I'm going to say event and I'm going to save that let's come here let's take a look at exactly what it is that we're selecting we're not going to work in a responsive tab I'm going to come in the console and when I click on this okay this is the final project I need to come here there we go so when I click on the header you can see we have that pointer event so we have all of this info right now I want to open this accordion when I click on the header itself not when I click on anything else when I click on the header and keep in mind if I jump into our HTML this button the span the icon elements the div the h2 all of them are within this header so I'm just selecting their parent which is the header okay so when I click on the header what do I want to do I want to expand on this header now there is something that I would like to show that to you you can see that we have a lot of info right here and there isn't where is that parent element so if I just type in here parent element let's select that let's click on it it says undefined because I need to come back one step I, I need to come one step backwards to show you what actually happens and you can see I'm going to clear this console click on this HTML and then I'm going to come right here click here and then I'm going to come and I'm going to click on this plus sign and each of these pointer events I'm going to open it and we're going to take a look at the target the reason that parent element doesn't work is you need to go inside the target and then from there you can access the parent element here it is which is the parent is button now what is the issue here what it is what what is it that I'm trying to explain to you uh, let me collapse this target you can see in the first click I've clicked on the header title all right and uh, let me collapse this entire thing as well in the second click I've clicked on the button so two clicks two different things which is not good because we're not actually uh, knowing what it is that we're clicking on and the third one is that plus sign so three different clicks three different elements what is the issue the issue is that the parent element for these is going to be different now for the icons the parent element if I take a look at that uh, where is it come on buddy the parent element is that diff indicator that is the parent element but what about the other two for the for this one let's take a look at the parent element where is the target you can see it's the button and if I jump into the parent element where is it let's click on these three dots uh, parent element you can see it's that h2 so for three elements three clicks three different elements and three different parents 
that is not good. So I need to change this. Now what I'm going to do is instead of selecting the header, I'm gonna grab the accordion. Okay, let me write it correctly, accordion container. I'm gonna select the accordion container. And the accordion container has a class of container. Now, let's do accordion container. And now let's take a look at our event. If I click on this, it fires. If I click on here, it fires. Now we need to provide some sort of a uh, control. So if we click on the header, we want the event to be listened for. Otherwise, we don't want the event to be listened for. Okay, we are gonna come back to that. So let's take a look at this. Within here, within this, first if I take a look at the target, you can see that we have the span that header title, okay? And now if I click here, this time we are gonna grab, what is it that we are gonna grab? We are gonna grab the button, cool. And if I click on here, this time it's also going to be different. It is that font item, awesome. Now, even though we get basically the same result, but there is something different. Now, if I jump into, if I try to print out the target from here, so we don't have to b go back and forth, now we got the span, we got the button, and then we got the, the I element, right? There is a method in JavaScript that is called closest. Closest method returns, you can see it right here, returns the first starting at element inclusive ancestor that matches selectors and null otherwise. Now, we have these elements. We need to provide an inclusive ancestor. We need to grab an inclusive ancestor. And what is that inclusive ancestor? That is the header class that I removed previously. Let's take a look at it. So if I now click here, I'm getting header. Click here, I'm getting header. Click here, header, and click here, header. Now, instead of clicking and getting different things with every each, each click, we just get one thing. That's it, and that is the header. Closest is gonna give us the header. Now, since we have selected this, it's a good idea to store it in a variable. So I'm gonna say const accordion header. This is accordion header, and I'm gonna paste it right here. Now, keep in mind that we only wanna have the header. If I click here, I don't see anything, right? I, I click here, uh, okay, uh, that's because we are not actually printing anything. If I just do console.log, accordion, uh, not container, accordion header, let's save this, let's click here, we get the header, 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 uh, and what we need to do is we need to make sure that we only get the header. We don't get anything else in case we click on it. All right, and I'm gonna come back to this. For now, I'm just gonna leave it like this. Now, from the accordion header, I wanna grab its parent, which is the section element. So I'm gonna say const, which is the actual accordion. There we go. So this is gonna be accordion header dot parent element, parent element, element. Let's save that. Let's console log it. Console log is very cool in this sense. If you wanna see exactly what it is that we're working with, accordion. Click here, we get section that has a data theme of JavaScript, CSS, HTML, so it doesn't matter, you can see we get those sections based on their data themes. So far, so cool. Now, what do I wanna do? Now I have selected the header because that is something that I wanna click on. And I've also selected the section element that I wanna expand. Now, what is it that I wanna expand? That is gonna be the height. So let's create a variable for that. It's gonna be height. And I'm gonna create a function that is gonna be get content height, this function is gonna give us the height for the content, cool. And I'm gonna pass in accordion, the height for every individual accordion. After that, after we have selected that, first let's create that height so we can actually see it right here. So if I say console 
dot log height if I log it to the console you can see get content height is not defined so let's go ahead and let's let's define the get content height function this could be a normal function declaration it could be an arrow function uh, I'm going to create an arrow function I'm going to say get content height this is going to be equal to now this function requires a parameters because we have already passed in an argument and that is going to be accordion so I'm just going to pass in accordion there we go now we need to grab the height the height for what let's jump into our html the height for this div that contains this paragraph how can we select that div let me jump into come on buddy jump into javascript i'm gonna say const uh, what should i call this div i could just call it accordion div right and then i'm gonna say accordion dot query selector now we saw that we can we can use uh, document.query selector document.query selector is gonna scan through the, your entire html but if you know where that element is actually residing that you're, you want to select it you can limit the scope of search by just selecting that accordion which is going to select every individual section and then selecting it from there as opposed to having like the entire html being uh, scanned through this is like this is a little bit faster but you're not going to see the difference you're not going to feel it you can do it this way as well uh, from the content class i want to grab the immediate diff and let's see now if this div already has height it means it is open remember our is open is open is what is open is when it is display block okay for the uh, plus sign it's going to be display none but for the minus sign it's going to be display block so i'm going to say f accordion de uh, if the accordion already has a class so let's jump into the class list class list dot contains this is another method if the accordion has a class that is is open then i don't want to do anything and i want to return return zero it means that we don't have any height for that because they content is already expanded and in that case this get content height doesn't serve any kind of function that's why we are just going to return zero but if it doesn't have any height then we want to select the height from it so uh, we're going to say accordion def dot there is a method in javascript that is get bounding uh, let me capitalize the first word bounding and then client and then rect I know it's like a really long one but this method is going to give us a lot of info when it comes to html elements like their height their width you can uh, with this you can select anything that you want otherwise we want to select the height uh, we can also take a look at this get bounding client rect height console.log uh, accordion let's bring it above let me click on the accordion uh, is not a function that contain uh, contains save that let's click here uh, this is the height you can see right so i'm gonna go accordion where is the accordion and it returns the height and we are console logging height right here so i'm gonna comment that one out we shouldn't see the height so it's gonna give us this section right that is our accordion if I do accordion dot get bounding client rect save that click on it you can see we have all of this info and from here what do we want to get so we can have bottom left right top width x and y coordinates we just want to grab the height for the accordion so if I just do dot height save it click on this you can see it's 72 for the HTML again for CSS and again for JS cool and now you know what is what that is and now that we have created that we are returning this value and we are console logging it right here and if i click on it this is the value and then this is the value and this is the value for all three of them 
So far, so cool. But we are not seeing this expand. That's because we are not actually updating any of these accordion, accordion sections. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create another function that is going to update the accordion. And I need to pass in which accordion it is that I want to update. And then I need to pass in the height for that specific accordion. Let's create this function as well. I'm going to create it down below. Uh, let's do a normal function declaration. This is update accordion. It, it has two arguments, so it requires two parameters. The parameters are going to be accordion and... Why did I keep misspelling height? There we go. And in here, uh, we need to first specify the content for the accordion, so we can grab the height from there. This is going to be accordion content. And uh, I could do document, I could do accordion, I'm just going to do document dot query selector, query selector, and from here, I'm going to grab the element that has a class of content. And now let's see if the accordion is closed or it's not. If the accordion is closed, I want to toggle it to open, not goggle toggle it to open and if it is open I want to toggle it to close that's why I'm going to use is open that part is done and then we need to select the height as well now we need to specify the height as well accordion content if I do accordion content let me just grab this console log so you can see exactly what it is I'm trying uh, I'm actually talking about Let's come here, let's click on this. You can see we got the content. The content is where the actual content resides, right here. But we need to grab the height from there. So I'm gonna say dot style dot height. Come on buddy, dot height. This is gonna give us the height of that. And you can see it's zero. Why? It's, it's not there. The reason for that is because of this. We have said the content doesn't have any height. So we need to change this value dynamically using JavaScript. So far, we know how we can change the classes or uh, HTML values dynamically in JavaScript. But when you say dot style dot height, dot style is going to give us access to all of styles that are in CSS. And when we take a look at the height, we know that there is no height because the height as we have specified right here, the height is zero. So where is the height coming from? We have already found up the height right here, and we passed it into this function, and from this argument, it is passed into here. So the only thing I need to do is just assign it to this value. Okay, and how can I assign it? I'm going to use template strengths. This is going to be H-E-I-G-H-T, and that's it. And because it's pixel value, you need to add that pixel value. Let's take a look at the height. So the height, you can see it is already working. And there we go. But it didn't work for the other two. So what I'm going to do is, let's cut this entire thing. And let's put it right here. Let's save that. And let's take a look at it. Working. Working. Okay, it's still... Okay, it, it should... It is not selecting it correctly. Uh, what, what is saying? Type error cannot read properties of null. Reading parent element at line 37. Line 6. Sorry. Line 6. Accordion header dot parent element. Hmm. Uh, event dot target dot closest. If we are not, okay, now here is where I told you that we are going to come back to that control flow because uh, we are not, when we are not clicking on the header, that's when this issue is going to arise. Now, we need to know, we need to make sure that we are clicking on the header. So if we are not clicking on the header, I don't want to do anything. So if header accordion header is not true, it means we are not clicking on it, then return from this function. That's it. Let's save that, click on it, it works. 
click on it, it doesn't work for this one. We don't see that error, that's a good thing. Uh, we don't see the content for each, for JavaScript. Uh, these, everything so works correctly so far. We have this plus sign, it is working and changing it correctly for this one as well, for this one as well. But if I just click on the HTML, it's just gonna show me HTML and I click on CSS, it's, it is showing me the content for HTML and the same thing for JavaScript. Let's take a look at where is another issue that we might have not noticed. Uh, let me just bring it up. It's maybe, it may be like, because it's a, oh, it's a function declaration. Let me click on it. And now, okay, this is the final one. Still, it is, it's returning undefined. Why is it returning undefined? And it doesn't matter where I, here if I click, it's returning undefined. And let me cut this part, put it on top of there. So the issue here is very simple. It's actually an issue of hoisting. Uh, that I don't want to get into, that is because we're actually declaring a function declaration. We are creating a function using function declarations, and when we create function declarations, this function call, it is actually hoisted to the top of the page, and that is not something that we want. In that case, it is actually running before the click actually happens. That's why we can't actually apply it on the other two parts of the accordion. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna convert this function expression, a uh, function declaration into a function expression. And I'm just gonna do const, uh, it's gonna be update accordion. And let's just convert it into an arrow function. Let me limit this search to the actual accordion itself. So for that, I'm gonna say accordion, and I think I know what the issue is. Hmm. When we say document.querySelector content, since we have three contents, right? I'm gonna collapse this so I can show it to you. We have one content within the first section, we have one content within the second section, and one content within the third section. So that dot .content can be satisfied three times in this web page. And when you say query selector, it's gonna grab the first one. That's why we are just, just gonna say accordion.query selector. Let us save that. And now you can see we are selecting wherever we're clicking. There we go. And that's it. Now it is working. I need to, where is the console log? Let me remove this, and I hope it wasn't too much of a trouble. Uh, I think these kind of bugs, they're good because they show you how you can think out outside the box, box and you can come up with a better way of writing your code. And now that our project works, let's, let's just uh, review it once. We selected our accordion container and we added an event listener on the accordion container. We said when I click, show me the event. From the event, we got the target, and from the target, we basically wanna grab the closest parent, which is gonna be this header. So wherever in the header I click, I just wanna grab the header itself, whatever in the accordion container. Now, accordion container is a big place, so if we don't click on the header, we wanna return from the function. If we do click on the header, we want to grab the header's parent element, which is the section, and put it in the accordion. And we also want to get the height for that section as well. So for the height, what we have done is we have said, okay, I want to grab the height of the section, but to be able to know the height of the section, I need to find out what is the content in there. Uh, that is within the div. If the div is already open, we are not gonna grab the height. If the div is not open, then we are gonna grab the height from there. And we're gonna pass it and store it right in this variable. And finally, we need to update each accordion, each accordion and give it a height. That's why there are two arguments. So for update, we saw it was a function declaration. They get hoisted. That's why it, it created that issue for us. That's why I changed it to this arrow function. And this update accordion, it's going to receive a parameter of accordion and a height. The accordion, we already know what that is. So if it has a, a class of is open, it's going to remove it. 
otherwise it's going to add it. That's what this toggle means. And then the accordion content, we are going to grab it from every individual section. Keep that in mind. We are going to get the content, go to dot style, which is going to get into the world of CSS. So, so we are going to add a style to every accordion content, and that style is a height, which is the amount of height where there is actually content there. And then when we save it, come here, you can see if I click on HTML, it's going to open up HTML, it's going to open up CSS, and it's going to open up JavaScript. So uh, that's it for this project. Let's jump into our final project, which is that calculator, which I promise is going to be, even though the biggest, but it's going to be the simplest of all of them. Uh, not in the project. Let's click here and... Let's create the project, that's project number three. Within here, I'm gonna create an index.html file. I'm gonna create a style.css file, and I'm gonna create an app.js file. Cool. This is gonna be a calculator project. Uh, let's do the link style.css. I'm gonna insert our font awesome as well which is going to be right here. Let's add JS script source app.js. There we go. So in the HTML, the HTML structure is very, very important, and you need to follow it exactly like I do if you want your JavaScript to work. I'm going to create a main element that is going to be the container for our calculator. First, I'm going to create a section element that is going to have calc display. This is going to be the display and I'm going to display zero there for starters. I'm going to create a section element that is going to be calc uh, buttons. All the buttons in here uh, within this section. Within this section I'm going to create a div. Uh, uh, this div is going to handle one row of our buttons. So if I take a look at this, uh, we have this row this row, this one, this one, and this one. So how many rows are we going to end up with? One, two, three, four, and five. Cool. And I'm going to align all of these rows using uh, CSS grid. This is going to be a class calc buttons underscore underscore row. Cool. Within the first row, uh, all of these are going to be buttons. Um, Within uh, and I'm going to give them a class of button, class of calc uh, hyphen button. And the first but this one, this is going to take up two rows and I'm going to signify it within the class name and I'm going to say two column. Uh, and the zero button, this is going to grab, uh, sorry, this is going to grab two columns and this is going to grab three columns. So for this one, I'm just going to do that, and I'm going to provide in C here. After this, uh, we have the second button. This is going to be uh, the arrow that is pointing towards the left. This is going to be the symbol for it, LA, RR, and uh, semicolon. And then we are going to have the divide symbol, which I'm going to give it a class of division as well. This is going to be divide, divide. Very cool, very awesome. So, so far, everything is making sense and nothing is complicated, right? I'm going to copy this and I'm going to comment, uh, change the content for them. The next row would be this one. That is 7, 8, and then this sign. Cool, the multiplication sign. So, we're going to have four buttons. I'm going to get rid of this part. Uh, for the first one, I'm going to have seven. And then I'm going to copy paste it down below. I'm going to have eight. And after that, I'm going to have nine. And let's get rid of that. This is going to be uh, times. That is going to give us uh, that symbol. Let's open this up, with live server, to see our changes. There we go. So this is what we have done so far. Uh, put it down below. This is the next row. For this one, I have four five, and then six. Uh, I forgot to change this to subtraction, uh, sorry, multiplication. And this one is going to be addition. Addition. The uh, symbol, I'm just going to use 
the plus sign on the keyboard very uh, four five six sorry it's four five six is subtraction this is not addition subtraction and this is the negative sign on the keyboard all right let's copy it one more time this is going to be one two three one two and three this is going to be addition plus sign on the keyboard very cool and the final row is this one where we have only two um, buttons one is going to be that number zero which i'm going to add it right here and this is going to be three column it's going to grab three column and then we have the equal sign which i'm just going to put it right here that's the equal sign for us so everything is awesome so far let's move on i think we are done with the html if i take a look at uh, the changes in the browser there we go very cool let's jump into css css is very simple as well uh, i'm going to put in all of this because we have already talked about this uh, just on the body i'm saying display flex align item center basically i'm centering the calculator in the center of the page uh, the container for the calculator is going to have a width of 40 rem uh, it's going to have a display of grid now, in case you're not familiar with grid i'm not going to explain it in depth i'm just going to be writing this i'm going to create three columns the first column is 10 rem now if you're not familiar with grid i do have a complete um, playlist here on youtube you can take a look at that there is a lot of html css that's a complete html css playlist is a complete course and i actually create three projects with flexbox and grid you're going to get a ton of experience with grid and flexbox cool but what i'm not going to do is uh, i'm not going to explain them here uh, i'm going to have uh sorry i'm going to have two rows the first row is going to have a width of 10 rem and the second row is going to be where all the other buttons so the first row is the screen of the calculator and the second row is the rest of the content i'm going to say align items center background color is going to be 2c 3639 let's save our changes there we go so this is what we have done so far very cool let's move on from there uh, i'm going to grab the button on the button I'm going to do font size of 2 rem uh, border none outline none uh, background none I don't like the uh, default styles for the button and then okay let me do the none and then I'm going to do a background color of uh, that's going to be 5d 5d seven two seven four let's do padding of two rem color is going to be white very simple styling transition all uh, 0 0.1 second is and out so far so cool let's do an a hover effect so when i hover on it you can see that it's actually showing which button it is that i'm trying to click on cool let's take a look at our changes this is what we have done so far we're going to fix the rest don't worry so button button hover is going to be on the hover i'm going to decrease to opacity to 85 percent and the active class on on any button is when we click on the button then the active class is going to be activated so if i click you can see it, it changes to light gray and the actual text it changes to this black text the color of the text so the background color will be ea uh, f6 f6 what is this background color and then the color is going to be black there we go let's grab the calculator display and fix that calc display <clears throat> excuse me uh, in here i'm going to do font size 2 rem 
uh, color is going to be white text align I'm going to align it to right uh, padding right come on buddy padding right is going to be two rem uh, two rem I think is too much I'm just going to go with one rem letter spacing uh, two pixels very cool let's grab the calculator button rows button rows so it's calc buttons uh, underscore underscore rows row or let me take a look at the class names so we have buttons row cool. uh, display grid uh, we have four columns remember one two three and four columns that's why I'm going to create grid template columns uh, I'm going to say repeat repeat uh, four and the width for each of the columns will be one of four and grid template rows I'm going to have five rows so repeat five and the height for each of the rows will be min content it's a good practice for CSS as well I'm going to grab the class name that was two column and I'm going to give it two columns grid column start from one into three and remember those class names that we provided and the one that was three columns with this the two column is that C button when you clear everything and this is the zero button where I'm going to say grid column uh, start from one end at four let's add the forward slash let's take a look at our changes there we can see it already looks way better than that than before uh, okay so far so cool and I'm gonna grab the division division and I'm gonna grab the multiplication I'm gonna grab the uh, subtraction subtraction and finally the addition these buttons I want to grab these and I want to style them they are going to have a background color of f sorry ff 9f 9f 29 font font weight will be bold for them and font size will be 3 rem let's save all of them and there we go okay uh, let us see what is actually the issue two column one two three okay let me two cal no two call this is better take a look at that and I didn't grab the equal sign I need to grab the equal sign as well some reason uh, this is a little bit higher than that I'm going to take a look at that as well uh, first I'm going to grab the equal sign equal and give it a there we go and now both of them are okay very cool now that the actual uh, calculator is done the UI of the calculator we're going to jump into the actual JavaScript now there are three concepts that I'm going to talk about before uh, uh, doing anything first thing is that I'm going to create a global variable called running total that is because for example if I do 40 right and if I do this plus sign you can see that 40 is gone and that 40 has to be stored somewhere so I'm going to say 40 plus 150 and when I do plus again you can see 40 plus 150 I, I need to store these values somewhere and I'm going to call that running total I think this is uh, I could just put them side by side right here that way it is going to be easier to code this project just going to put it right here uh, we don't need that much real estate here anyway so I'm just going to bring it right over here I could just give it a little bit more very cool so I need to keep track of that keep track of uh, track of that value and I'm going to create now I'm going I'm to be creating this with let because that value is going to change uh, running total 
Initially, it's going to be zero. Next up, uh, when I'm actually doing this calculator stuff, you can see I'm, I'm going to end up with these numbers. So I'm going to have 78, like 7854. This is one value, right? So there is going to be one value that I need to keep track of, and that is going to be a running total, but then there is that value that I'm actually showing on the screen. That one I'm going to call buffer. You're welcome to come up with a better name. But at the end of the day, everything that we are showing in the world of JavaScript, it is actually going to be a string. So I'm going to store it as a string of zero. Cool. And there is something else that, that is going to be the last thing that we need to keep track of, and that is going to be the operator. So when I do 7, 8 times 6, and then I say plus. So before plus, what was the operator? That was the multiplication. So we need to keep track of that as well. I'm going to say previous, uh, previous operator. And I'm, I'm going to def uh, initialize it, but I'm not going to define it to anything. I'm not going to assign it to anything because we don't know what the previous operator is, but we have to create that variable. So far, so cool. Let's grab the screen of the calculator. Uh, this is document.query selector. And the class name for that is calc display. This is the screen of the calculator. Make sure you select it correctly. The first thing, first things first, the first thing that I want to do is grab the click event. At the end of the day, when I do anything, I'm just actually doing, uh, I'm selecting the click event, all right? And um, I want to hear, uh, sorry, I want to listen for click events. That's why I'm going to be creating a, um, an event listener. But that event listener is not going to be on any kind of element. That event listener is going to be on is not going to be on one singular element. It's going to be on all of the elements or on all of the buttons that we have in here. So if I jump into my HTML, you can see this calc buttons. Uh, okay, let me take a look at the calc buttons. Okay, uh, this section right here, calc buttons. So all the buttons are within this section, and I, on this section, I'm going to add an event listener. Uh, I could uh, store it here as well. So I'm going to say const uh, all btn container, all button container, and I'm going to select a document.query selector. Let's select that element. What is the class name for it? It's this one. All the buttons are within here, and we are listening for this one. And I'm going to say all btn container dot add event listener. What is the event that we are listening for? It's a click event. Cool. And when the click event happens, I'm going to run a function. What is that function? That function is going to accept an event, and it is an arrow function. First off, let's take a look at our event, console.log, so we can see what it is that we're trying to work with. And I'm right here. I'm going to go to inspect. I'm going to bring this right here. I could give this a little bit more real estate right here. I think that's this is fine right here. I'm going to zoom out in here. Let's jump into console. Save that. This is coming from line number nine. All button, calc buttons, const document that query cannot read properties not reading. Uh, if I click on, why is it not selecting it? App.js. Cool. Document that query selector. Oh, I forgot to add the dot. We are not selecting it correctly. So if I click on one, you can see that we have all of this info available to us. If I jump into target, we have already talked about target. And from target, if I jump into the inner text, you can see the inner text gives me the exact button that has been clicked. So if I just do dot target dot inner text and save this, this is one, two, three, 
to zero. This is gonna be the plus sign, negative sign. The So everything that I wanna click using this, it's gonna give me that. And I'm gonna store this inside a variable. Let's get rid of it. This is how you know how you can store it inside a variable. Now, is storing this inside a variable a good thing? No. Why? Because depending on what I click, I want to do something. All right? So I'm going to create a function that is going to be button click in general. It could be a number. It could be a symbol. So I'm going to classify these into two groups. I have numbers in here, and then the rest are going to be symbols. I'm going to pass that in there. That's basically going to give me what it is that the user has clicked on. And then I'm going to run this function. Now, what is this function? Let's create that. This is the function, btn click, and it has an argument. Therefore, I need to pass in a parameter for it. The parameter is value. Value could be a number. It could be a string. Uh, sorry, it could be a symbol. Now, when it is not a number, it means it is a symbol. So I'm going to say if the value is in a n, it means that it is not a number, right? We have talked about that. Then I'm going to create another function that is going to be handle symbol, and that function is going to take care of it. When the button that the user has clicked is in a n or it's not a number, it means that it is a symbol then I'm gonna handle it within the symbol. And I'm gonna pass in whatever the user has clicked, which is that value. Else, what is else? Else means that this is a number. I'm gonna comment this one out as well. This is not a number, uh, aka symbol. And the bottom one is, this is a number. And when it is a number, I'm going to add another function as well. Now, the reason uh, to add this function is that if you don't add them, you can just handle all the logic right here. Then this button click function is going to get a very, very, very big and it's going to be uh, out of control. You will not be able to maintain it. For example, if you come back in three months and take a look at it, you're going to get confused. It's like you're breaking up the, uh, the logic into several smaller functions that are easy to digest and easy to understand. And I'm going to create another function that is going to be handle number, and I'm going to pass in the value there. And whatever the value is, whether that is a whether that is a symbol or a number, at the end of the day, what do I want to do that? What do I want to do is I want to show all of that on the screen. So this value, uh, this variable that I've selected, I want to update it with that button that the user has clicked on. So I'm going to grab the inner text of there. Why do I keep mistyping it? And I'm going to set it equal to the buffer. Cool. So far, so cool. Let's move away. Uh, the first uh, function that I'm going to create is going to be handle number. And after we have handled the number, then we're going to create the handle symbol function. I'm going to create a function that is going to be handle number. Uh, I'm going to pass in the value since so it requires a value. Now, at first, when I refresh the page, we, saw, we know that whatever value that is being shown in the display of the calculator, that is the buffer. And what is the value of the buffer? It's a string of zero. So if buffer value is a string of zero, what does that mean? It means that the user hasn't done anything. Cool. The user has not done anything. And this is the first time that the user is interacting with this. So then I'm going to grab the buffer and I'm going to set it equal to the value. What is the value? Value is whatever the user clicks then. So when you open up the calculator, there is zero, there is nothing. And then when you click two, it means you have done something. So when you do something, what should happen next? In the else, I'm going to grab the buffer and I'm going to add to it the value of number using the, uh, the increment assignment operator. Why? So I have clicked on two. When I click on five, so it's like 25. I'm trying to write 25. Should I add two to five or should I just put it right next to two? 
I should put it right next to five to two, right? So if when I click on five, you can see five is being put right next to two. I'm not adding them because I have not clicked on any kind of symbol, any of these operators. And then let's say the number that I'm, I'm gonna clear this out. The number that I'm trying to write is 1,563. So 1,000 and then 500 and then 60 and then three. Is this is the this is the logic that we want to implement? But first, when the buffer is zero, the value is going to be equal to the buffer. Cool. We are going to give it the value. What is the value? The value is the first number that the user clicks. In this case, it's one. And then now the buffer is no longer zero. Therefore, we're going to jump out of this block and we are going to enter the else block. When we enter the else block, I'm going to click on the five. So I'm going to keep adding on to the buffer. I'm not going to add it. I'm going to just put them together. Cool. Because when I say 1,500, it doesn't mean that I'm adding one and five. Basically, I'm putting these numbers together. Cool. This is what we want to do. And we can take a look at that here as well. If we take a look at the console, if we take a look at the buffer. So I'm clicking on one. Uh, inner text line number 22 we're gonna I'm gonna comment this one out and we're gonna come back to that so it's one and when I click two I should be able to see 12 not one plus two three there we go it's 12 and then three and then five so this is exactly what I want to show on the screen cool so now that the handle number is done we can move on and we can talk about the handle symbol function. Function handle symbol. Okay, handle symbol. And in here, uh, within the handle symbol, since the value we know is a symbol, it's not actually going to make sense if I just pass in value. So for handle number, I passed in value as a parameter, but for this one, I'm gonna pass in symbol. It doesn't matter. You could pass in value, but that doesn't make sense. Now. In here, we need to have a bunch of if statements. If the user has clicked on the C, which clears the entire calculator, or if the user has clicked on this backward arrow, or the uh, division, or multiplication, or uh, subtraction, addition, or equal sign. We need to have cases for all of them. Now, you could use if statement and add if else, if else, or you could use switch statement. I'm gonna use switch statement. So I'm gonna do switch. I'm gonna pass in the symbol. And then, then we are gonna talk about it in the form of cases. So the first case is if the symbol is equal to this C, it means that the user has clicked on this button. And what happens when the user clicks on it? So it doesn't matter what I do or what I multiply, when I click on it, everything is gonna reset. So when the user clicks on it, the buffer is gonna reset, which means it's gonna be that empty, that zero. The running total is gonna reset as well, which is gonna go to zero. And then we are gonna break out of this case. Cool? So far, everything is okay. Next up, what is the next case? The next case is, let's say when the user has clicked on the equal sign. What do we wanna do then? When the user clicks on the equal sign, for example, 12, plus three and then equal sign. We can see we have 15. What happened to the previous operator? It was reset. So we need to reset the previous operator, but before resetting that, if I just click on 12 and if I click on this equality sign, I have not selected any operator. What should this equality sign do? It shouldn't do anything because we didn't perform any kind of operation. We should at least add two numbers or multiply two numbers. First, I'm gonna handle that case. So if the previous operator is equal to null, this is a good use case for null, we wanna return from the function, return from this case. Why? Because if the user just says 12 and then equal, the user hasn't done any kind of operation. You need to do 12 plus three, then equal, then that, uh, um, Equal design is going to work. So if the user, if there is no previous operator, we are going to wrap up the func this case and we're not going to do anything. But in case there is a previous operator, we need to catch it. 
Where is that going to be? For that, I'm going to create another function that is going to be a run operation, and I'm going to pass in the buffer. Now, since the buffer is a string, we need to convert it into an integer because we are actually doing mathematical operations. And there is a function uh, there is a function in JavaScript that is parse int that is going to convert a string into a number. Cool. So when we click on this run up when our run operation runs the operation and everything is completed, what happens then? So 12 plus 3, it's 15. So at this point, where is the previous operator? There is no previous operator. So the previous operator is equal to null. We are basically wrapping everything up. And then buffer is going to be equal to the running total. Buffer is going to be equal to the running total. And then what we are going to do is we are going to, run, we are going to equal, uh, uh, grab running total and we are going to make it zero as well. So if I say uh, 12 plus 3, 15, and if I do plus 3, and then we are going to get 18. So the reason that we stored buffer in running total was because after the, uh, the equal design, the user might add or do some kind of operation on that number again. But when we click on this, keep in mind, if I just do th plus, you can see that 0, that is where this running total 0 is. That's because of that, because we need to show zero at the end of the day. And let's get out of this breaks, uh, case. So we have handled that case. The other case that I need to handle is going to be this back arrow. The division, subtract, uh, multiplication, subtraction, and addition, all of them will be handled by another function. Don't worry about that. So in case the user clicks on this symbol, uh, uh, the resource code is at your disposal. Go ahead, open that up, and from there, just go ahead and copy-paste this back arrow. If you do anything else, it might not work, so you need to provide it there. So if the user clicks on the back arrow, what happens? So let's say this is the number, and instead of 78,000, I have made a mistake. I want to say 71,000. So I'm going to click on this once, one, and again, and again, and again. So one, and then 581 or 584. Cool. So every time I every time I click on this arrow, it has to remove one number from the screen. So I'm going to say f buffer dot length is equal to one. Then buffer is going to be equal to that zero that we have provided. It. Else, it means that. If there is just one number, and if I click on it, you can see it says zero. That's where this if statement is catching. If the length is just one number, it just shows zero. Otherwise, it means the length is more than one number. We are going to grab the buffer, and from the buffer, we are going to say substring. We are going to remove one string from there, and we are going to use the substring function. So I'm going to add zero as the, as the starting number, and and I'm going to say buffer dot length minus one. So we are subtracting one from the length of it, removing one from the length. And then let's break out of this case as well. This is the biggest function handle symbol. Everything is making sense, right? And then what I would like to do here is I'm just going to copy paste this code. And you can, again, just open up the resource files and you're going to see all of this code there as well. These symbols, I just want them to work correctly. So this is the um, sub, uh, division, subtraction, sorry, multiplication, uh, subtraction, and then addition. For all of these, what do I want to do? I want to create another function that is going to handle, handle the mathematical part of it. And I'm going to pass in the symbol as well. Why, why am I passing symbol? Because based on the symbol, we are going to apply ma the arithmetic operations. If the symbol is add, we are going to add numbers. If it is subtraction, we are going to subtract numbers. And then let's break out of here as well. That's it. We are done with this function. So there are two more functions that we need to create. The first one is run operation, which I'm going to create right now. And the second one is uh, that handle math. So I'm going to say function 
run operation, and I'm going to pass in um, uh, I'm going to pass in the buffer. But keep in mind, we have actually converted the buffer into an integer. So I could say like uh, int buffer. This is going to be int buffer. It means that the buffer is now integer. So basically in here, we want to have four different operations. If the operator is addition, if it is subtraction, multiplication, or division. So let's just go ahead and do it. So if previous operator is equal to, I'm going to copy it from here. If it is equal to addition, what do I want to do? I want to grab the running total, and I want, I'm going to use the uh, increment uh, assignment operator, and I'm going to add it to the buffer. Cool. I'm going to add buffer to it. Else if, you can convert this into a switch statement as well. Else if previous operator, else if um, previous operator is equal to uh, subtraction. Let me add the symbol right here. If it is equal to subtraction, what is it that I want to do here? I'm going to grab the running total and basically do the same thing. I'm going to copy that, put it right here. This is going to be decrement. Cool. Uh, let us copy this. One and then two. Think. I need to get rid of that. And else if, okay, get rid of this as well. There we go. So if the previous operator is multiplication, what do I want to do? I'm going to add the multiplication sign here. And if and else means it is division. So if it is not addition, subtraction, and multiplication, it is division. Let me add that slash there. So there we go. That's it. That is the run operation. And after this, the only thing else that we need to do is we need to handle mathematics. And that's what I'm going to do on top of here. So I'm going to grab a function and I'm going to say handle math. Uh, what is this going to grab? This is going to grab a value. Let's go into our calculator. So far, we don't have anything. And we are not actually showing anything to, any, anything to the screen. Let's save that. Uh, it's properties of null screen. Uh, is it the same thing? Screen calc dis display, sorry. Display, you can see now it is showing those numbers, but it is not handling it because we are not actually handling the math. So we need to handle math before uh, it can do anything. Now, uh, if the buffer is zero, there is not going to be any math. So there isn't any number plus any other number. So we need to control that logic first. If buffer is equal to zero, it means the user hasn't done anything. And just wrap this up. Don't do any kind of operations. But if the buffer is not zero, what, is, what else we are going to do? So first, we are going to grab our buffer and we are going to convert it into a number. Because now we don't want strings. We want to have numbers because we are actually trying to do operations. Parse int. And I'm going to pass in the buffer. Uh, if, I'm going to say if running total is equal to zero, running total is equal to zero, I'm going to set the running total as the buffer. I'm going to set it to the value of buffer. Else, I'm going to run the operation function. Else, uh, else I'm going to say run operation. And let's pass in the int buffer. There we go. And finally, we need to specify our previous operator because remember, we have initialized it, but we have not defined it. We have not uh, add, we have assigned it any value. We need to assign it a value. And what is that value? That value is going to be based on here. So I'm going to say previous operator is equal to value. And when the user clicks on any of these buttons, for example, 89, then this, you can see the buffer becomes zero. We need to make it zero as well. So buffer is going to be that string of zero. And let's take a look at our uh, calculator. So 78 minus 
five, we should get an error. Run operation is not a function. Okay, uh, run operation, line 70, where is line 70, parse integer, run operation, even though we have created it there, handle symbol, btn click, run operation type error, line 70, it's not a function. Okay, so run operation, I'm passing the buffer, provide a space there. If it is the equal sign, let me just reload this page, 78 times 98 plus this, and then when I click on this, it's just going to give me when it is equal to zero. I'm going to provide a space between these cases. Okay, let me first check the other ones. So you can see that C works. If I do 878, all of these numbers, if I click, it's going to make it zero. Cool. This also works. So only this run operation, uh, it doesn't work, and we need to fix that. Cool. So far, everything looks okay to me. It's just 3, 2 plus 3. It's not doing the operation. Yep. It has to do the operation. And I'm calling run operation here as well. What is this? Why is this run operation? It has to be running total. There is the mistake. Running total. So if running total is zero, what does that mean? Uh, I, I, th I thought I explained this, but I need to explain it one more time. So I'm saying 12, right? Plus, you can see this is zero. And when I say plus, and then I'm going to say three, and I'm going to say equal sign. This is 15. And when I say, okay, I want to multiply 15 by, let's say, six. You saw immediately when I clicked on this multiplication sign, the running total, it went away. Where did it go? it became zero, even though it, there is that 15 number, but we are showing zero. This zero is actually coming from this buffer. So if running total is zero, we want to put running total back into the buffer. I have to set it equal to the int buffer because the buffer itself is actually a string. We need to make sure that the value that we pass in into running total, it has always, it must always be a number, not a string. That's why I'm going to say int buffer. I need to set it equal to this variable because this variable is the number representation of the buffer. And let me go full sc screen. So uh, what else do we have? 7, 8, 9, all of these minus all of these. And when I do C, it's going to be, it's going to go away. And now the uh, equality sign is not going to work. So 12, 1, 125 minus 125, it's that multiplied by 10, we still must get 0, cool. 784 divided by 785, we get this value, which is very cool. 98 multiplied by 3, we get that, plus 320, we get this, divided by 10, we get 61.4, multiply by this, minus this, can see so everything is working correctly and I think that's it uh, I had a blast uh, creating this uh, I had a blast creating this crash course it it went a little bit longer than I expected I was expecting to finish it like in four to five hours and it went a little bit longer than that uh, and um, the source code is again in the video description and if you like this video just make sure to uh, do me a favor and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And this is the first time that I'm, I think this is the first time that I'm saying it. I'm going to get used to it very soon and very quickly. Uh, the source code is going to have two links. One is the Google Drive link, which you can just directly download it. There, the other one is GitHub if you want to clone it or just grab it from there. You, you can download it from there as well. And if you're interested in learning more about JavaScript, there is a bootcamp that I've created uh, that is live on Udemy. Uh, there's more than 60 hours of content. I talk about all of this and a lot more. Um, I'm really, uh, uh, I'm really happy that I was able to create this and and 
give it to you for free. Uh, it's an honor. And see you in the next video.